live. Welcome to TT Boy TV. It's February 3rd. Yeah. We're, I'm considering this like Black History Month. You know right, I mean? right, yes. So, yes, sir. today our guest is one of the most popular erotic stars of our time, a multi award winner, a yeah. businessman, a man who I believe prides himself in performance. Oh, yeah. All right? Please welcome the superstar Lexington, the man of steel. <laughs> What's up, TT? What's going on, brother? How you doing, man? It's good to be here on your show, man. Yeah. You know? Appreciate you coming. Thank no you. No doubt. No doubt. We go back a long time, kind of. Yeah, we go back a long ways. Way back into the 90s. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. But before we go too far, let's say... um. How'd you like that game? It was the day um, after the Super Bowl. I thought it was great. You know, um, I'm not really a ch um, Chiefs fan or, or 49ers fan, but I do enjoy um, Patrick Mahomes. You know, I enjoy watching. I'm a, I'm a fan of him. Um, and uh, so I'm happy the Chiefs won. Also, I'm a fan of Andy Reid. You know, going all the way back to when he was coach of the Eagles. You know what I'm saying? I'm an East Coast guy from New Jersey originally. So um, I've always liked Andy Reid. So I'm glad that the Chiefs won. You know what I'm saying? The 49ers, you know, they kind of messed up because they should have ran it. But, um, you, know, uh, you know, kudos to both of them, champions and Chiefs. Yeah. The Mahoney's a good, a very good um, quarterback yeah. right now. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, I, he won MVP, as we know. Um, is he the best in the NFL right now? It's hard to say. Um, although, obviously, Lamar Jackson from Baltimore has been killing it, too. But um, he's going to be very – Mahone is going to be very, very good. Uh, he's going to be great for an extremely long time, I think. Mm -hmm. Durable dude, courageous, uh, good leadership skills, um, highly reliable, you know, in and out of the pocket. So – you know, I'm a big sports fan, so watching last night's show was, uh, for me, was a lot better than the last couple of years because the last couple of years I watched it at Super Bowl parties or out at a bar or something. And last night I watched it just at my spot, just by myself. You know what I'm saying? You know, right up on top of my big screen, watching it, you know, have my own food, turn the volume up well loud, really loud, and just enjoy the game. So, yeah. yeah. Good, you can focus more. I mean, it's much more enjoyable. You can hear <laughs> shit. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I saw the last couple of events, for, you know, at, at these bars um, in the Valley that are fun to watch sporting events at. Mm -hmm. But you can't hear, you know, if you like to hear the guy, hear the commentary, which I do and all that. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a good night last night. Well, you know what happens, I think? What was that? You start getting older. <laughs> <laughs> Being like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm not going out. I'm hey, staying my ass home. <laughs> but you have a picture of like an older guy, you know, doesn't want to be bothered that watch sports, right? Yeah. You're like, don't fuck with me. I'm watching my sports, right? Don't fuck, you know, I like the boxing yeah. and UFC. Don't yep. fuck me, I'm watching, right? What are you fuck? So yeah. it's like, when you get older, you ah, I think that's the way it is. Yeah, it, it is because, uh, I found out the hard way when I realized that um, I was willing to get the UFC pay-per-views even if I was by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be, you know, I'll get a UFC. I don't need to, you know, I, you know. There was a time I wanted to throw a fight party, and it meant something happened. You know, now I'm just like, what? <sighs> Bing. You know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I pay. Hey, look, I'd pay seventy nine dollars for myself to see this, so I go ahead and do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, so you like UFC too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big time, big time. As a matter of fact, before I came out this afternoon, I was watching um, um, the, the, one of the documentaries with uh, for Jones and Riaz. So that's going to be a good one. Although I, Jones is looking good, um, I'm not too familiar with Riaz, but I don't think that he's going to beat Jones. I don't think so. Or Jones, yeah, I don't think so. I, I truly don't believe he's ready for Jones. That's what I think, you know? Right? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway. I mean, it, it, I'm unfamiliar with the guy's name, now, which doesn't mean that, like, he's not what he is. Mm -hmm. It's just that um, I think the Jones, you, you know, if you're ready to fight Jones, then we would have heard of this guy a lot more leading up to the fight. 
You know what I'm saying? I think um, who's the uh, the Swedish dude? Um, Gaffersons? Yeah, man. Yo. Yeah, he put hands on Jones, man. Like wow. the second, the second fight was more decisive in terms of Jones, you know, being more dominant for the win. But I mean, truthfully, I thought he was beating the striking game. Mm -hmm. Got on Gusterson, the first one or second one. Second one, mm -hmm. Gusterson was beating the striking game, and Jones said, "Fuck this, I'm taking him down." And yeah, him. yeah, and you and you're right because it's a pure ground game. Um, but whew, I mean, he. Because the first one, like I said, depending on where they, you know, they could have went either way, the first one. Although I think maybe, I think the scales were, you know, I think he definitely won. Although it was very, very tight. And the yeah. second one, yeah. so yeah, I, I enjoy UFC, you know what I'm saying? All the weight classes, you know, and the women, you know. Huh. Yeah. Who's your favorite fighter? Um, of all time? Um, yeah, UFC, yeah. Mm, yeah. All time and current. Well, I would say, um, um, <sighs> Well, boxing, I'm a Mike Tyson guy. You know what I'm saying? He's from my generation. Um, you know what I'm saying? I, you know, that's my guy, uh, Mike Tyson, as far as the square circle. Um, the octagon, um, you know, it's hard to say. Uh, I'm a Mayweather, Floyd Mayweather fan also boxing, but not so much as you know, a Mike Tyson fan. UFC, I like Jones, uh, always have, you know, um, I, I like uh, St. Pierre. He's been one of my guys for a long time. Um, you know, I started to like uh, Tyron Woodley. You know? Really? I mean, well, 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 I mean, look, he had his moments. It's like, remember like when Roy Jones for a, for a minute was like the man. I think Woodley was kind of like the Roy Jones of uh, UFC. I have to debate on that. But the last couple of times he's gotten his ass kicked, right? Well, I'm just going to say, because I watched Tyron Woodley. Yeah. You know? And I understand fighting pretty well. Mm. And in my opinion, yeah, he had a great speed. Yeah. But he was always being cautious about his energy, right? Mm. He wouldn't lay his balls on the line. Mm. He was always just waiting for the right time, right? While Jones was not waiting for the right time. He might have been, but he wasn't fucking around. Mm. So he'd come in there and try and blast you out. Yeah. I mean, bah, those left hooks yeah. coming. Elbows, know. reverse elbows. No, but Jones in boxing, he came oh, blasting. Oh, I mean Roy Jones. Yeah, Roy Jones. Right, right, okay, okay, right, right. You said Roy Jones, right? Yep, yep, yep. So Roy Jones came in, you know, going hard. But Tyrone Woodley, to me, had all that great, you know, skill, mm -hmm. but he wouldn't use it. Like we like a Tyson mm -hmm. or a Jones or a Hearns where or we a Hagler. Blow up. Yeah, but the, yeah, but I don't know. You know, it's like the pacing necessary for five rounds of UFC is more exhaustive than, or comparably more exhaustive than boxing, um, and, and even that's debatable. But you know, but I don't know. I mean, you know, Roy Jones. I always, I don't know. I guess maybe I look at the two of them similarly because they look physically the same, you know. But um, but no, well, UFC. Um, like I said, um, you know, Rampage. You know, um, Anderson Silva. Oh my God, the Spider. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know. I mean, his time you know. is amazing. Yeah, yeah. And now these new cats. I mean, you know, um, the uh, what's his name? The Israel. Oh yeah, you know what I'm saying. Nice. You know he's Israel great. Israel Asante. Asa yeah, yeah, he's killing it. Obviously, uh, uh, Jorge Masvidal. I mean, oh, you know what I'm saying. Who's gonna win that fight? Who's going? Jorge Masvidal mm -hmm. versus Kuzman. You know, um, I would have to say Usman's gonna would win is going to win that one. Um, you know, I know it's not. It's, I think it's a July. Date they have set already for it, and um, um, you know I'm a big fan of Jorge, but uh, Usman's very very strong, um, and you know obviously Masvidal's got ground game as well, um, but I, I like I like Usman just from a standpoint of um, I think he's he's bringing an edge to the fight um, that maybe Masvidal hasn't really gotten to it yet, although they do have a hate for each other to develop. I, mean, I think that, that Uzman's going to be able to turn his attitude, his, the negativity of his attitude, in a way that'll probably uh, give him the edge. I'm going to have to say that the 
way Masvidal puts things together, you know? You know, he puts the kicks, the punches, and throws yep. together very quick and very smooth, mm -hmm. which makes it makes him very dangerous because the one split second. Usman is super strong, yeah, but um, he's a touch slow, mm -hmm. I believe. You know, with his punches and you, his defense is a little bit open. I see. You know what I mean? Well, he's strong enough to take a punch. He's a touch open, and Masvidal is very sharp at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But but the thing is is I think if if Usman goes for the ground, mm -hmm. if he you know if he shoots Masvidal, obviously Masvidal's got a good takedown defense. But if he gets him on the ground, I really think that um, Usman's strength will pay a dividend if they go to the ground. Now obviously he, he's going to have to take a few to get in there, and Masvidal will deliver those few. So he may not be able to get close enough to shoot Masvidal because Masvidal got a good leg game too. He might catch a knee or a flying knee on the way in. You saw that knee? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, like, that was like the greatest thing ever. <laughs> like, you know, like how the, I mean, that was like. Beautiful. And the thing is, is, is you know, he knew that, that old boy shoots like that coming out of the, um, you know, coming into the beginning of the fights and, and um, to be so, t so effortless, effort, effortlessly target time his so time it with a flying knee. Like, whoa. Like, that was masterful. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. He can put shit together yeah. at this point in time. Yeah. It's very scary. The way he did yeah. Diaz, put that shit together, was like lightning and precise, which makes him real dangerous. But let me ask you this, though. In the fourth and fifth, um, would he have sustained Diaz as Diaz comes on late in, you know, late mid third rounds when Diaz begins to really catch his footing? As long, and, you know, and then fourth and fifth is where he really owns. I don't know. I know that's that's a good yeah. point, but yeah. the way he was putting together and so uh, explosive, yeah. I think yes, I think he's because he was opening up Diaz. I look, I like you know, like he Diaz. opened him up. He was right? opening him up like damn. Uh, wait, well, let's move on to okay. But we're here for the match. Went to the club after the fight, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, he wasn't like Diaz went to the makeup, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, no. No, I mean, Diaz, man, is, Diaz is a killer. But oh, I love him, man. I mean, you know, he got um, he got fucked up, man. Yeah. Well, then again, he always he he he's known as for his skin breaks apart, but yeah, yeah, yeah. he's such a battler, and his skill set is uh, yeah. representing Stockton, I guess. So it's been years, really, since we spoke. You know, I mean, really, mm -hmm. since we've been years. I mean, really, the last time yeah. we sat together was probably. On the Frisco ride uh, to the, uh, with you know, Dion. GBA. Uh, <laughs> right? Holy shit. Yeah, that was like, that was like, oh, three. Probably way. Yeah. yeah oh, three. Oh, three. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, back, way back. Oh, three or four. Yeah. So, oh, three. Yep. I'm going to have to tell you that I'm very impressed with what you accomplished. Oh, thank you. Appreciate so, it, bro. Appreciate yeah. it, man. Congratulations. No doubt. No doubt. You've come a long way and you've made yeah. a, a dent in the business. Yeah. Yeah. You know I mean, how do you feel about that dent? Well, you know, um, I, I had a, a period where, um, you know, Mercenary Pictures is my company, and we, you know, we did exceptionally well for for about a decade. Um, I would say '03 to 2013. You know, I had a sustained period, a ten year period of uh, we were putting out a great product, but um, you know, as the business model changed within the industry, you know, and you hear the stories of, of how those changes killed off a number of companies. Well, mine was one of the studios that was really damaged by um, um, the type of stuff that took place in terms of when the business models changed, the industry changed from an economic standpoint. And my studio was one of the ones that really were impacted by that. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. It's the, you know, I would call them the pirated people, the pirates of the <laughs> the, pirate, the pirates of the, pir the Caribbean, but not really. It's more like the, pir <laughs> the pirates of the fucking internet. You know what I mean? Yeah, a man. wild west of ah, low down, <laughs> purposeful, rotten, orchestrated rats. You know? Yeah, man. Ah, you fuck know. you. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and, and you can't you can't do anything to these guys, but uh, you know, it's like, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So my my studio was one of the ones that um um. You know, really took it, it took a really hard impact, 
And, um, uh, you know, luckily, um, you know, we, you know, I changed, you know, I added different stuff, uh, opened another label as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it was like 2013 was like the last, um, where we were like really, really, really like doing exceptionally well. Um, and then subsequent to that, when you have to downsize regardless of the quality and caliber of your production, when you're downsizing, you're, you're stepping farther and farther away from, you know, from the majority where the money is being made, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, yeah, you know, shit. Now, uh, the latest thing I have is, um, Lex Steel Media Group, which, um, is not only Mercury Pictures, but, um, um, you know, also a platform for other studios to distribute through. Um, and that's been a challenge as well, because, you know, you need market capitalization to be able to uh, distribute other people's products. So that was always a challenge for me because I was always self-financed as you were. You know what I'm saying? So, you know what it means, to, you know, um, where, you know, it's like, you know, you know, a lot of weight on your shoulders. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, you know, when uh, and then people forget, it's like, yeah, like the reason why everybody's salary is being paid is because. You know, I'm doing these scenes, not because I, I didn't have like, you know, um, an outside um, resource. So I was like, if I wasn't if I wasn't doing scenes, um, <clears throat> I wouldn't be able to, to, you know, keep the wheels turned, keep the lights on. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, nobody knows. Yeah. But in my heart, I always believe that you're a person that has appreciation and respect for the art of performing. Oh man. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, um, a lot of people, um, take for granted that it's really an athletic event, you know, it, it, male and female performers, you know, and, and those that look at it like that, um, are the ones that have an, an immortal presence, you know, an unforgettable presence like yourself, you know, matter of fact, um, you know, um, my first scene in L.A. was December of 1997 for a dude named Michael Raven. And the scene was T.T. Boy, Guy De Silva, Anari Vox, and myself. That was my first scene in L.A. in December of 1997. So we actually go back. You go back to my first scene ever in Los Angeles was like the major leagues, right? So it's a really big deal because, um, you know, you have always been legendary as never having failed in a scene. And, 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 and male performers know, like, the hierarchy starts with T.T. Boy because no one has ever, no, <laughs> has ever, is, you're never known to have failed, you know. And, and so I know we were talking about that earlier where, um, you know, when, I, when we talked about how it happens that sometimes guys have a bad day, but you've never had a bad day. And the thing is, so when I did that scene in December of 97, I was like, holy shit, this is like my idol. Because you're from, you're, you know, yeah. you, you, you know, it's like, it's like, yo, it's like T2 and shit. And then to see, you know, Guy De Silva, you know, I knew Guy De Silva for a long time or, or enjoyed his work too, but he wasn't a hero. No, he's not. You know what I'm saying? He's, uh, he's, yeah, he's but, not a warrior, right? Right, right. So when it was like, when it was like, you know, holy. And so it kind of was like, man, like, it was intimidating because it's like, yo, this is like the dude. Um, and I was like, I was like, well, shit. All I was like, look, I'm not. I just can't fail. I'm not. There's no way I'm gonna be able to out perform. <laughs> you know, to, I might be able to hang with Guy to Silva, but just don't bomb in the presence of TT Boy because that was that was one of the things. Um, you know, um, and, and and what people don't know is like, um, you know, it it is it can be very. It's a it's a physical thing that we do, and it's like playing ball in the park. Sometimes, like you know, it's like yo, you get. You know, you gotta. You might switch off from your guy to another guy, and all of a sudden, you're stuck in front of like Michael Jordan. You're like, oh shit, what am I gonna do? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so I got kind of thrown into the. Um, that was into your first the, scene. That was my first scene in L.A. Whoa. Which is, I remember, like you know how, how like they were shooting on the East Coast prior to that, right? Mm -hmm. I started shooting. Um, I did my you know, my first uh, scene was well, my first test. Um, in terms of getting the uh, the blood test was December 96. So I started what would have been 
December 96. And, you know, 96 was when it really was rolling, you know, that year, my first year, 97, the full year of 97 on the East Coast. And then um, January of 98 is when I went to AVN. And then from there, um, you know, from there, like I stayed five weeks in, in, you know, in L.A. after the show, after the Vegas show. And then I came back uh, to New York and then... um, and I decided to 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 come out to LA. What the people don't know is that in ninety seven, ninety eight, yeah. ninety nine, they don't have Viagra. You're right. Yeah. Viagra's not there, right? Yeah. So if you come on a set, yeah, you really got to be a performer. You got to be able to do it. Yeah. You can't be hiding behind yeah. the blue shield, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right? But so yeah. I read in a magazine one time. You know, I want to, since you brought this up, you know, mm-hmm. I, mean, I read in a magazine one time that you did an interview and you said, oh, yeah, what people might not know is that the performers are good, but when it comes to T.T. Boy, he's a god amongst the performers. Yeah. Did you say that? Hell, yeah, I said that. <laughs> right. Yeah, man, like, I wouldn't tell, that's for real, man. And, you know? And that I was the best performer in the United States? Or? Yeah, I said you were the best best American performer ever. And, like, mm-hmm. you know, it's like people say... Uh, um, uh, it's like, you know, it's like, you can't just, there's, there's you and then, and then there's everybody else because no, everybody is like, no one can ever say that they've ever seen you have a bad day at the office and, and male performers know that fuck, you know, it's hard to, it's very hard to go 10 for 10. It's very hard to go like the stream together. Well, maybe it isn't today. But I mean, like, when, I, when I started like some days, you know what I'm saying? You know, and even through the years, um, I don't think everybody's, no one's ever matched that. No. Never ever matched Still that. never matched me? Not at all. Since you brought no. it up, I'm going to say, I talked to, did an interview with Nacho. Yeah. And just to let the records, you know, be straight so everybody understands, Nacho told me, you know, I didn't know this, right? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Nacho told me that Rocco said, when you go to America to work, you'll be fine. You know, you should be able to kick their ass, mm-hmm. you know, performing. You know? Mm-hmm. But don't fuck with TT. <laughs> 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 right? That's, I know that's yeah. funny, right? Nice. Well, the thing is, is like, um, you actually, um, you know, one of the things about the people took take for granted was very few people kept the type of fitness that you maintain. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like a lot of guys, there was no one that was in the type of shape that you kept yourself in. You know, well, P- obviously Peter North, um, did very, very well to keep himself in great shape as well. But, um, uh, you know, th- th- your level of sustained energy yeah. wasn't masked by anybody else. And that's attributed to the type of fitness that you, that you maintain. And, um, I'm one of the few people that, that took that into account, um, as part of how, you know, I created, you know, my whole thing was sustainable, high energy. You know what I'm saying? And then it was kind of like, you know, as a craft, you get to the point where you're looking at at that level. And I thought that you had it at that level. So um, it, it, that was definitely um, one of the reasons why I was able to do well early is because, the, you know, not only did I watch people watch their performances on movies, but as you get to know these people and say, OK, wow, this is what's the mentality of this particular person. You're one of the people that I learned from as far as like, say, hey, you got to take it to a level of seriousness. You know what I'm saying? And, and um, um, obviously it sustained you for a number of years and it sustained my, me for a number of years. And, and um, so hopefully, you know, um, just like uh, a lot of people looked at you and then develop their their craft and emulate you in the development of their own craft. I hope that other guys have watched me, you know, and uh, and said, "Hey, this is one of the things that Lex was doing," <clears throat> because it all goes back to you. You know what I'm saying? And uh, um, you know, that's what's up. Well, you know? <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. It's very yeah. nice. You know, very. Yeah. But you you're right. I was in good shape, and yeah. I don't think people know. Sometimes I would do thirty the 40 sprints at nighttime, almost like five days a week, sometimes in the street, sometimes in a park, 50, 60, 70 yards, sprint, bah, 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 mm-hmm. or run five miles and then, you know, be in boxing or, or some type of martial art, you, mm-hmm, know, I mean? mm-hmm. you know, JKD. So I was in pretty good shape. Yeah. 
You know, so yeah, you're right. At yeah. one point in time, I was in incredible shape. Well, well the thing is, is like, you know, <clears throat> when people, you know, when people are stroking, there's one thing to stroke, do strokes, but then you had high RPM, right? And your high RPMs was, you were able to sustain that RPM for a longer duration. And the people now, in discussing it right now, if people were to go back and look at your performances, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? Like, you look at guys now, they might have high high RPMs for about, what's 20 seconds or 25 seconds, right? But that's 25 seconds is incomparable to what we would see if you go back in the day and we'll see what you're putting down, say, like, in a, you know, um, in a missionary where you're able to keep it, you know, that high rate of, 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 of stroke pattern, you know what I'm saying? And um, like I said, man, it's just like, uh, a lot has changed, you know, and, and I'm not saying that things have changed now for the better or for worse. They're just different. Uh, not for yeah. better or worse. It's yeah, just, it's just different. Yeah. It's different. Yeah. So you're neutral. Um, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I kind of would like to say that, um, you know, I kind of um, um, prefer the way, you know, it was in my era because I. Um, I think that people earned their position of, of being called a star, where in this age with social media, a person can do one scene and then automatically consider themselves a, an adult video star, an adult porn, or a porno star. And I think that the, the term has kind of been um, diminished, you know what I'm saying, if not bastardized, you know. And, and um, I think that those that... that are aware of the eras know that um, exactly what I'm talking about, you know, because there was a time when like you had to put in some work yeah. before someone called you a star. Yeah. I, ironically enough, when you say that I had interviewed Nat Turner oh, yeah. like two weeks ago and he said straight out, he goes, listen, I'm going to take some of those X's off of your triple X. Do you guys think you're stars? Yeah. You're not stars. You're not, you're not an internet, you're not yeah. a porno star, right? I mean, I, like you know, I'm going to elaborate on that, you know what I mean, on that point, because in our, my time, which is in the 80s and 90s, and, you know, I, whatever, some of the thousands, you know what I mean? But especially in the 80s and 90s, if you're a fucking performer, you're going to have to be proven to be reliable and perform all the time under insane circumstances, right? Rough on a rock, nighttime, three or four o'clock in the morning because you've been on a set for 20 hours yeah. and now you got a fuck girl you don't like in front of, on a stage in front of everybody. Yeah. No Viagra, no coverage, no nothing with yeah. a bunch of people that you are not comfortable with and your nemesis is right around the corner staring you down. Yes, the, boy, <laughs> the boyfriend or the, the husband or, or like, or the girlfriend or, or, or the chick. Or even the guy that wants your position. Yeah, 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 stud, yeah, you know? yeah. You know, I had a lot of haters, right? Yeah. You know, and so after all that, you know, maybe five, six years or four years of that, then maybe, then you could be considered a porno star if you're solid. Yeah. Right? But if you're not, I don't, between me and you, there's a lot of actors that have been in this business. Yeah. I would never consider them a porno star. No. Just, just someone that has done porno. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, even they've done three, four, five years, six years. Yeah. Guys but that doesn't make, yeah, yeah. You, know, you might be a veteran, but being a veteran doesn't make you a star. Yeah, you're not yeah. a star. You weren't in yeah. the grind. and It's the pressure of the big sets in those days, I believe, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Big directors' names, big sets, a lot of pressure, working consistently day in, day out, is that is how you prove yourself. Yeah. You know, if you're, you know, solid, good, or you're a piece of shit. Yeah, and, and the difference, too, is um, um, now there's a lot less, uh, um, there are far fewer feature feature sets, and feature sets are, are, are more difficult to perform under, and you did a lot of feature movies, you know, as well as Gonzo. I mean, before Gonzo, there was just features, and you were doing them all. So, um, yeah, it's it's not saying it's any better or any easier. Um, 
but it's a different time. But I, I, I appreciate when I came in because it was a lot tougher. And I also think, too, that the girls were a lot more challenging, too. Not taking anything away from today's girls, but um, there was a lot of women that that did movies to our eras, uh, which um, you had to go to bed the night early the night before. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying? Like, you know, a couple of them girls man, you're like, oh shit, where are you look at your calendar, like, oh, oh damn, be like, yo, all right, look, all right, who's one of those girls? <laughs> um. Uh, shit, where did I start? Belladonna. Um, shit. She was an animal, huh? Yeah. Gianna Michaels. Um, Naomi Banks. Sarah J. Um, you know, um, too many that I'm missing, you know, but rest assured, like, there's a difference between uh, when you're, when you got a monster <laughs> or more like, not a monster, but more of a beast. You know what I'm saying? And back in the day, there was, there was, like I said, there was some, there were some girls that um, were, took their job. I mean, Phoenix Marie, um, you know, where they take their job very, very seriously and they're great at what they do. And I don't mean just, you know, fucking, but matching their, their fucking with an athleticism that they apply to fucking. You wonder who else was pretty athletic that you missed that you probably would have appreciated was Janet Jackme. Oh, no, 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 no. I did it one time. Yeah. How was that? Well, well, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, it's crazy, you know, um, for when you finally get a chance to, to work with someone that you really enjoyed before you got to the business. Janet, um, I have to say, Janet was great. I don't think that, uh, I think what I didn't realize was part of her dynamic and part of her energy was the fact that she had a very, very, like, her pussy was very, very, and you can attest to this, her pussy was not, like, the biggest pussy. So it was, like, her taking penetration, she was going crazy. Um, and so <laughs> when I used to watch her, I thought it was all an act, her, how crazy she went. But when I worked with her, I was like, no, she's going as crazy because she's got a tight box and she's doing all this with a tight box. And that was why she was wilding out. So, um, yeah. She's really got passion, I thought. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? But here's so, a girl. I'm going to bring up this girl who mm -hmm. was probably for me the strongest girl. You know, that you had to have super energy to keep up with her. I mean, you really had to be on your A game. She will devour you. Mm -hmm. And she was tall, too, mm -hmm. and strong as fuck. I think you missed her. Debbie Diamond. <laughs> well, yes, I missed her. I missed her on camera. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, am I right or am I right? <laughs> yes, you were right. She was a. Mo I mean, let me tell you something. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, say it. Yeah. The, <laughs> well, um, you know, when when you get a chance to 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 enjoy someone that you really enjoy watching before you get into the business, and you're actually with that that woman or that girl, um, sometimes they live up to it. And sometimes it'd go well beyond it. <laughs> and with Debbie, it was, I was like, wow, not only is she like what people see on camera, but she's even, she's even beyond that. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we're to the point where at a certain point you got to be like, okay, look, I've got to hold on here. Right. <laughs> and not only figuratively, but literally, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And part of it with her is, um, she's such a, uh, an energy you know what I'm saying? That, um, yeah, you got to hold on for like, okay, look, you got to hold on to make sure that the sexual dynamic or sexual hierarchy, man to woman, is still maintained here where you're like, <laughs> look, am I fucking you? Or like, are you fucking, am I just along for the ride here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah, she, you know, Jeannie Pepper, you know, from back in the day. But Debbie um, Diamond, I love Jeannie, but Debbie Diamond. Yeah. The strength you had to have in the scene, because she'll fuck you up. Yeah. The scene. So when you did it, 
she tire you out a bit? No, but no? but the thing is, is is she didn't tire me out, but I had to make sure that I, I I had a really hard erection when I was fucking her because if not, if you were a little bit, if you weren't hundred percent strong, she could break your shit uh-huh. because she's coming down on you, like you know what I'm saying, and she's and she's she you know she's um was always fit. You know what I'm saying? Even to this day, she maintains, you know, she's always been um, um, a fit woman and she's a big girl. Six foot tall, maybe. Yeah. So, you know, you know, so yeah, you you always had to be uh, on point because otherwise you might get broken. She's like one of those Nordic warriors, right? (laughs) (laughs) Be like a Viking, you know. Yeah, Viking, exactly. (laughs) You know, like. She'll uh, fuck you up. (laughs) You know, they hear this horn in the back of. <laughs> no, but, no, Debbie was the shit though, man. I mean, yeah, she is even to this day. Yeah, she's cool. Yeah. So you were a fan of the business before you got in. Oh my god, that's why I'm a historian. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? So I'm a historian. I was yeah. a big fan. Yeah, man, I definitely. Don't if, I don't know if you're a bigger fan than I am, but I'm more of the '80s. I appreciate a little bit of the '70s. But um, what um, let's go to the '80s. What mm. girls did you like in the '80s? Um, I would say from the eighties would be like Angel Kelly. Oh. Um, Angel, uh, Angel Kelly. I'm gonna mm-hmm. let you know was the reason I pretty much told myself one night after I jacked out ten times. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I gotta get in here. I gotta yeah. get in this business. Yeah, man. Right? Angel Kelly. Something about it, right? Yep. It's fine as shit. I, I loved her lips and her eyes and her smile. Um, Nina Deponka. Um, uh, shit, Ebony Eyes, Sahara, oh, she's Sahara, yeah. Yeah. Sahara's kind of thin for me, yeah, but it's beautiful, yeah. yeah, she was very pretty, very pretty, don't get me wrong. Um, obviously, Jeannie Pepper, um, you know, what I'm saying, and then uh, Marve, do you remember Marve Dinor? She didn't do a lot of movies, she was the dark skin, had some meat on her bones, she was sexy as hell, yeah, purple passion, hmm. purple passion, yeah, yeah, she yeah. was great, yep. Yeah. Um, At home, she was great. <laughs> oh yeah, oh, nice. And um, but and then a lot of the white girls, um, um, I can't remember. Ginger one. Lynn. Uh, Ginger Lynn was good. Amber Lynn was good. Both of them. Candy Evans. Well, Candy Evans, I'm a breast man. Um, Chrissy and, Canyon. You know, now that one. <laughs> Christy Canyon was a shit. Um, although I, you know, yeah, yeah, she was. I love big ass areolas on those big ass titties. <laughs> Did you ever work with her? N- no, no. Mm-mm, no. I was with her last night. Oh yeah. Not sexually, you know, yeah. at the Super Bowl party. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me yeah. tell you, you know, she was on the show too. Uh-huh. But, uh huh. But she may be the sweetest girl I've ever seen in the business. And genuinely, not full of shit. Like, really, she might be the yeah. sweetest girl you ever know. Do you know her? I know her, yeah. yeah, yeah. What do you think? Yeah. No, I love her, man. I mean, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where, um, because I'm a, I'm a breast man, I, she's always been one of my favorites. Like I said, she's got these na- big natural titties, and I love areola. So she's got those, that shoes area, those shoes Silver areolas. Silver dollars, you like? Yeah, man. <laughs> big fucking pancakes on the motherfucker, right? <laughs> <laughs> You know, but, um, oh, obviously, uh, Vanessa Del Rio yeah. was, like, my ultra favorite. Um, Nina Hartley um, as well, but, but yeah, Vanessa Del Rio. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah. Did you work with any? You worked with Nina, probably. Right? I worked with Nina. Um, I worked with Heather, Heather Hunter. Oh, yeah, how'd you um, like Heather Hunter? She was... She was she, Heather was great, you know. What I'm saying, uh, you know, you know, I, you know, I like I like bigger women, thicker women, but um, um, Heather was fantastic. Um, uh, She's got a good head game. Yeah, and it was her eyes, man. You know, what I'm saying she had something, right? Something. Yeah, about her. she had. The, you know, and the, what's fucked up is, um, you know, I worked with it with Vivid, and so it was a condom scene, and so. Oh. I always regret um, not ever feeling, uh, knowing what she felt like, for real, for real, <laughs> you know. So then I'm going to bring this point up, because yeah. believe it or not, there are, I've talked to a few performers who do not appreciate or even notice or respect the good walls. Oh. So yeah. I ask you, yeah. are you somebody who can totally feel 
the sugar walls that are the bomb. Do you know what bomb pussy oh, is? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And God, wait, there are men that don't know? They can't... Oh, my God. No. Let me tell you like... Mark Davis doesn't give a fuck. Really? Paul he, Thomas doesn't care. And... They well, don't know the difference, they say. Yeah, but 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 not for nothing. Um, Mark... Uh, is Mark... Is he circumcised or no? I don't think he's circumcised. No, uncircumcised. And the other dude that said that you mentioned, Paul I don't know Thomas. what Paul Thomas is he circumcised or uncircumcised? Probably uh, not old school. I don't know. Probably not. I don't know. Now Mark, being an Englishman, you know, over there they, they don't necessarily, you know, of his age, his generation, they didn't necessarily circumcise automatically. Yeah. You know, what I'm saying culturally they didn't do it. So maybe that has something to do with the sens- sensitivity. I don't know. I know, like Francis Rocco got an adult age uh, circumcision after in his in his 30s yep. because he was tired of it. So, so it could be a sensitivity thing and maybe or maybe not, but like I can differentiate between um, um, even, even, even by the race, even, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, uh, in my opinion, um, you know, Latina pussy is, is like the most uh, of all the different types of derivations of human the major, I would say, you know, Latina pussy, um, is hot as hell. It, well, is, is, is literally the best, the best pussy in terms of, you know, all things considered, you know, uh, with black women, I think, uh, black pussy is great. I think it has to do with what they do, what, what black women do with their pussy. Um, with white women, um, you know, it's a random. Some girls feel good. Some girls know what to do with what they have. Um, um, Asian women have a way of of um, of of their pussy feeling like it's lined with with something very very you know purposely made for 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 comfort. You know what I'm saying? Where some girls, you know, not necessarily made for comfort. It's made for tightness. And these are things that make pussy different. There's some pussy that you go inside and literally once you get inside there, you look up at the girl like, what the fuck do you got inside this motherfucker? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Where you, you're right? Yeah. Where you're, getting, you're like, okay, wait a minute. If I move one more time. I'm fucked. I'm fucked, right? And you got to like, you're recalibrating your shit. Like, okay, this changes everything, you know? And, and you know, for the current ages, um, in my opinion, um, Annika Albright and Nikki Benz, uh, currently, and, you know, and, and Nikki Benz just, um, um, she just hosted the Avian Awards for 2020, um, are the, the, in my opinion, they're, you know, two of the, um, uh, the first come to mind when you talk about incredible. White girl? They're white? I'm, yeah, they both happen to be white, but, but, um, Kara Mia, um, um, is another one, and then from back in the day, uh, Cinnabons. Cinnabon. You remember Cinnabon? Yeah. Yeah, man. I never... Actually, you know... Yeah, I, I think I hit it once, yeah. Well, here's another one for you whose pussy was fantastic. It was Monique. Yeah. Remember? You remember yeah, Monique from your team? She was... I mean, she was such an... She was very strong. <laughs> she was a monster, an man. Yeah, man. <laughs> she was Yo, dynamite. <laughs> yeah, man. You had, you had to really man up. Or see where you like, okay, I'm going in. <laughs> like one of us are coming out this motherfucker. <laughs> she and was it, strong. You know what I'm saying? And she would look at you like with her mind. Like, oh, yeah, man. come on, motherfucker. You know, I was like, what? And I was like, bitch, you're fucking her head's gonna sort of. Yeah. I'm like, all right, but she taught a lot. A lot of girls tried to uh, come within her footsteps, but um, yeah, she was one of the greatest, man. But. She you was know. a great performer. Yeah, she was. She was fantastic. I yeah. thought that Janice Pussy was bomb. And you know who else I thought had really crazy pussy? Yeah. Was Midori. <clears throat> okay, okay. I, I got I got you. I got you. Hers was great. Um, but I'll tell you, I think I got one for a kitten. I didn't hit it. But I oh. wanted to because it's the way I like them. I like them big and fat. Yeah, man. Yo, let me tell you something. Kit, yeah. Mm. Kitten, I think, probably had the greatest pussy I've ever I've ever been with. She she yeah, Kitten has the best pussy I've ever had. Really? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I've probably yeah, I probably the numbers that I've done probably are in the thousands. Now, what do you think? And, uh, Five thousand? Nah. Huh? I don't you know, honestly, I don't know. I have no idea. I would say maybe um I think it might be 
above, certainly above a thousand, maybe close to two thousand. I don't know. The thing is, is like, got people. I need to put them in the proper perspective. When you think of how many people, two thousand people actually would be two thousand women. Um, that's a lot of girls, and even in my mind, I can remember quite a few people. Um, I'll be hard pressed to remember two thousand women, although that might be the number. You know what I'm saying? But like, like when I hear numbers of like, you know, Will Chamberlain with twenty thousand, and uh, you don't believe it. I mean, yo, mathematically, I just don't see how that would be possible. I've got, I've got a higher number, you know. I'm pretty sure I'm about 12,000. For real? Okay, like you, okay, all right, cool. I'm not confident that my numbers are anywhere near that. But I'm slowing yeah. down. <laughs> okay, well, no, I, that's fantastic. I, I don't know, I don't, look, if someone told me my numbers were greater than what in my head I can fathom, then I'll take it and I'll be like, okay, cool. But... I think I would rather make, for me it's like okay I'm like damn could it well then again it, I mean look I started like um, by by 97 I was doing you know I was shooting fairly regularly in New York then in 98 through 2000 um, you know 19 um, I, I, I just still can't say my numbers would be over. You yeah, know. those are still great numbers. Yeah. But let's go back to the good pussy, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if you know, but I'm all about the pussy. Yeah, yeah. I'm a pussy man. I love them fat, long, and juicy, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Open it up like a flower and they get that flat. Fat on each side. Yeah, you know, yeah. I don't like them yeah. flat. Matter right. of fact, one, a long time ago, I made a movie called yeah. Dr. Camel Toes. Puffy Pussy Adventures. <laughs> <laughs> and Jake played God, right? I just <laughs> broke out of a mental asylum. Okay. And he tells me, beware of the flat pussies. <laughs> okay, God. <laughs> and I'm uh, looking for the fat pussies, right? You know, yeah. not flat ones. Fat ones. Yeah. Beware of the flat ones. I don't like flat ones. I yeah. fat. Yeah. Anyway, so there was a girl, you know, that you might have seen in the movie. She was her walls were so good. Mm. Her name was Shawnee Cates. She mm. was this Asian girl, mixed Asian girl, mm -hmm. Indian and Korean. But she has some crazy Shawnee stuff. Shawnee Cates. Yeah. That was like 1990, 91, 92. Wow. But she had some great stuff. There's a lot of girls that had great stuff. Yeah. You can't bring them all up. Some just hit you in the head. All right, here's one for you. Um, Sharon, uh, what's Sharon's name from... Um, from AIM. Mitchell? Sharon Mitchell. Yeah, her shit was like... You work with her in a scene? No. <laughs> 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 no, I wasn't. But, oof. Uh, I mean, yeah, well, that was back in the day. Remember um, remember the parties that Vince Voy would throw? And he didn't invite me. He was afraid oh. I was fuck all the girls. I don't know. Oh, yeah, you guys, well, yeah, you guys are probably blunt heads for the same casting, for the same spots. Okay. Well, um, yeah, man, he used to have these ridiculous parties at Avian. Really? Yeah, man. And, and, you know, that was back when, like, uh, the, I think, like, the early to mid 2000s, mm -hmm. right? By, by 2006, we were probably, like, the last of the good voyeur parties at Avian. Um, and so you got Sharon Mitchell there, or you got some other ones? Oh, um, I mean, it, it, <laughs> her in particular, uh, her and I, we actually got a chance to, um, you know, to, uh, to, you know, do our thing. Um, Sharon Mitchell, in my opinion, yeah. you know what I mean? I used to watch her in the movies when I was younger. Yeah. Something about, she had that hard ass body, that hairy, yeah, lean, black pussy, yeah. with black hair, you know what yeah. I mean? And something about her, she was an animal, right? Yeah. Something horny about her, yeah. right? So you look at her. Very like, lustful, yeah. You're like, you're like, Fuck. She knew how to turn on the, make it the click in the guy's head. Yes. But man. I work with her. I did two scenes with her. Yeah. She was good. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, yeah, but my experience with her was like, I mean, you know, she sat back and. Uh, um, did it? I remember, I'll never forget, like, she sat back on the couch, put both her arms up on the couch, and she's she's fairly, she's very leaf, very long, you know, and she just had her heels on, opened those, her long legs, and then just was like, you know, come basically, essentially, come get it. But in this way, like this goddess, like 
you know, come get, you know, I mean, she just told me to, you know what I'm saying? Seductive. She had yeah, to. man. She just welcomed me in. And man, I'm telling you, <laughs> that, I, that was the greatest experience because like, you know, that was, yeah, like um, great memories. But yeah, her shit is fantastic. But she, something about her too. You know, it's also yeah. psychological. We have to throw the psychology into it. Well, some women come from psychology. And then some women, like I said, like, yeah. are you just... On no. sight, on touch, you're just like, oh yeah. my god. But you have chemical reaction, you have yeah. psychology, and then you have yourself. You know yeah. what I mean? So sometimes when the grill and your chemicals get you moving, yeah. Sometimes you become more sensitive. Yeah. You know what I mean? Then a grill you're not as hot for. Yeah. That might have equal, you know, walls. Mm -hmm. But since you said you didn't get to work with Heather with. Out yeah. Adam, she had good walls, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand. No doubt. I do not doubt that whatsoever. But I, let's, uh, I'm glad you like pussy like I like pussy. Yeah, no, I, like I said, you know, it's... um. Yeah. There was a there was a girl, Rebecca Bard, though. She had a really good pussy. Yeah. Remember her as a... I know Rebecca Bard, though, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, she has some good pussy. But um, yeah. let's look back. Let's go back a little bit. And before you got in the business, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, let's take a stroll. Did you ever think that you would become this well known and this um, popular of a performer? Um. Well, okay. Uh, n no, <clears throat> I thought that um, I could get, I could work in the job because I looked at it as a job. Um, I looked at it as. Um, it allowed me to, to be a professional athlete, all right? You know what I'm saying? I, you know, as a soccer player my whole life, um, you know, as a goalkeeper. So you were um, um, a competitive soccer oh, player? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I played, uh, I played in college, you know. Um, I played after college in men's leagues throughout the uh, – here in, 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 uh, in Southern California. Because, like, you're a taller – you're fairly tall, 6'3"? 6'2". 6'2"? Yeah. I don't um, I don't really watch soccer that much, but when I do see it, it doesn't seem like the – Men are that tall. Nah, but but the goalkeepers are. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, and, yeah, and and it, the highest level of the sport is being played in in the English league, mm -hmm. English Premier League, as it's called, and um and the goalkeepers are six four, six five, six six. Oh, really? So I, as an American, I wasn't even tall enough to make it in in, in Europe, yeah. because in most most of the countries, you know, at the top leagues, the goalkeepers minimally are at least six four. Mm -hmm. Um, so so you know um. But 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 I I knew I could after college I knew that my career was over um, as far as you know playing for something that meant something you know what I'm saying and now I'm just playing men's leagues but being a porno performer allowed me to get paid at doing something that I was athletically skilled at doing and and I thought as long as I could hold it down as a pro athlete would be what my career in this would mean I didn't know that I would actually be in the win stuff you know um, but I took for granted that um, there were people that would mentor me to allow me to, to become a better performer or be a performer that people put a spotlight on. Yeah. So you thought you would have a job, but you didn't think you'd become this popular? Well, because well, when I came in, <clears throat> if I look at my contemporaries, when I, around my era, it was you, it was Jake Steed. There were literal, there were dudes that were considered superheroes. Right. And so to come into that realm and then try and unseat a guy like how <clears throat> it's got kind of like um, you go shoot for a video team and the scene before you had Marcus had Mr. Marcus, the scene after you um, and then you're doing your scene and then Jake Steed walks in, in, in the studio. You're like, what the fuck am I doing? How, am I, how can I sustain? How can I make it? So the first couple of years you're thinking about, can I hang? And while I'm trying to hang amongst Mark Davis and, and, and Vince Voyer and, and um, any of the anabolic guys, Shawn Michaels, any of the anabol anabolic guys is, is my error, right? You know, so it was just a matter of, of, you know, can I avoid the attrition rate that is so high for male performers? The, the rate of turnover, guys who get an opportunity that are lucky enough to get an opportunity that fail out. And not being one of them, I got lucky because I, I damn near failed. I, I actually failed out, um, with um, uh, with anabolic the first time I shot with them. Now this has been the company I waited my whole life to work for, 
Wow, but, really? Oh, man. Five days after the avian of 98, um, I've been working every day in L.A. And it was like the fifth day. Right? <laughs> and so I was going to work for Anabok, which was my favorite company my whole life, right? Or not my whole life, but I mean, you know what I'm saying. Like, um, they were my It was like the Yankees or the Lakers, right? Playing for them. And, and um, what happened is um, I made the mistake of telling them that I knew of a girl that was still in town that uh, would be available to shoot with me or that I knew was available to shoot. Not necessarily with me, but I just opened oh, my mouth and told them that she was available to shoot. So they booked me with this girl that I had had a room with for the whole week since we got back from Vegas. So you've been fucking. I've been fucking. Like, she, I've been working during the day. She had been working during the day. We come home and fuck for four days. And then the fifth day, they told me they booked <laughs> her. I was like, no! <laughs> Kryptonite. <laughs> I mean, I've been fucking this girl. <laughs> no offense to the girls, but you need a little yeah. excitement sometimes yeah, on the set. Yeah, man. Especially like when it's when you're like, okay, if I was like, I could not. This was like a chance of a lifetime. I, you know, started in 1996. Here it is, January 24th, 1998, and uh, I had to work with this chick, and I bombed. But what the, what happened was. <clears throat> Although I failed, right? They were like, um, they were like, well, look, um, you know, no big deal. It happens. Do you want to stay for dinner? And so the owners of Anabolic, Chris and Sue, um, asked me to stay for dinner. And I had, to, we all had dinner. And, and then um, after we had dinner, um, they said, look, you know, um, we liked you enough that we asked you to stay for dinner. Obviously, because normally, you know, you would have, you know, would have let you go as soon as you failed, but we'll give you another chance. And the next time I worked for them was when I did the job that, you know, allowed me to become one of their guys and it led to me becoming one of their guys. And that led to me, you know, developing who Lex still became, you know, Mike John, for instance, um, um, uh, did a lot for me because he was the first director that, that took the camera from below my waist up to my face where, you know, um, he allowed me to in, infuse my personality into the scene, right? And that allowed, like, people to get to know how crazy Lex Steele was on camera. And that developed the personality that, um, that, that was, you know, the basis for my popularity was, like, you know, um, not only was I putting it in, but I would tell you how good the pussy is, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And that was because Mike would go to my face, and he wouldn't go to my face to just get a superficial look. I would actually have to contribute. You know what I'm saying? So that, and that's part of, you know, as you know, that's what Gonzo is, is the, the performers acknowledging the camera. But for me, um, uh, it was, it was uh, show, you know, allowing my personality to become a part of my makeup as a performer. You know what I'm saying? And so, so and then also he taught me how to shoot camera. But um, that came later. But, but, um, but yeah, 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 yeah. How did you feel? I mean, because I have not, you know, I've never failed, but I've had a couple scenes. I had one scene when I first started that was, you know, having a hard time getting through, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, I did two scenes back to back my first day. Yeah. And I had met this pretty black girl, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. The day before. And so I took her home. I fucked her from <laughs> from like eleven at night till about seven in the morning, <laughs> right? And I didn't know any better. Uh, but it was my big chance. I'm gonna be a porno star, yeah. so I get down there. Yeah. And they give me this girl who I'm not really that attracted to, but I do the job. Mm -hmm. A little hard to come because I never came on camera, so I did it, no problem. And then they give me a scene back to back, but I had just been fucking her, yeah. you know, because it took me a second to come, and I probably did a three hour scene. For the first season, yeah. now we're 11 hours of fucking, right? Yeah. And now I got a back-to-back -back scene in front of people, which I'm pretty modest. Mm -hmm. And so the girl was sexy, but not my type, right? Yeah. And she's like, what's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> right? And I was like, <laughs> nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the thing is, I, you know, I can plead the job and, yeah. and, and, you know, did okay. I wouldn't say good, but that's like my first day, yeah. right? But the pressure and the feeling just off doing that, because mm -hmm. I'm a person that likes precision, 
You know what I mean? I, I, even before I was a porno star, right? Mm -hmm. I like to try and do things perfect. Your, what did your brain tell you? <laughs> you know, when you were, when you failed, what did you feel like? Uh, you, you know, honestly, um, I was probably really, really well prepared to do movies because of the type of athlete I was. Um, what I mean by that is like, like as a, as a, as a soccer player, as a goalkeeper, if I made a mistake, my mistakes immediately registered on the scoreboard. So I was used to functioning in a manner that, that necessitated perfection. If I made a mistake, there was nobody behind me to stop it from becoming, you know, a goal and thereby a score. So I always, you know, live, I always flourish under that type of pressure. Um, it, it, you know, um, I was an all American high jumper, um, as, as a high school athlete. Um, and it was just me versus getting over the bar. So if, if, if I failed to clear the bar, there's no responsibility, <clears throat> but my own. So, you know, it kind of helped me becoming a performer because, um, <clears throat> when it's you and whoever you're working with, regardless of who you're working with or who's shoulder to shoulder with you or how many other people are in the scene, no one can really, as a dude, no one can really help. <laughs> Not for nothing, but, yo, like, it's one of the few <laughs> sports where it's really on you. Because, if, like, Liam, at our counterparts, our female counterparts, they can dial it in. They can get some lube. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Uh, uh, oh, scream bloody murder. But you got to fucking... You got to get the fucking motor running, man. Before Viagra, let's say. Well, right. yeah, I mean, but think about it. Even, at, you know, even my experience with, with, with those things. Um, yo, you could you could still, sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But it's just a notion where, like, as, as a guy in this business, you know, it was all on your shoulder. So I was kind of tailor-made for it. I was prepared for a situation that demanded for the weight to be on my shoulder without being able to push the responsibility or excuse it onto someone else. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then that kind of, kind of led me to, to kind of hone myself, like give myself a bit of a harder time, which allowed me to get better quicker because I didn't want to, I didn't want to fail out. Cause I knew, um, word travels so fast, you know, uh, in the early days, yeah, really, even fast. in the early days, you, you know, it's like, you know, like, man, like, you know, you fuck up by the time you get back to the crib, you know, <laughs> yo, I heard you had like, oh, damn, <laughs> yeah. it was way worse in 89, mm -hmm. 90, really small, you know, so it really was dangerous, but so you <laughs> didn't beat yourself up over that. Day. Nah, nah, nah. Huh? Because, because, like you know, because as a goalkeeper, someone scored on you. If you carried that into into the next minute of your play, it was going to haunt you. So I'm saying, if you if you if you didn't clear that particular attempt at the bar, um, the next time it's, you you couldn't carry that with you, or you'd fail that next time. Yeah. So as a performer, it was like kind of like I need to forget that that happened, but I need to be prepared for what I'm doing right now. You know what I'm saying? So it's like. Whenever I would, if I, if I had um, great days, um, I didn't hang on it. You know, um, if I had a bad day, I didn't dwell on it. It was more like a baseball player every time that they go into the batter's box. They got to forget about what they did last time up at the batter's box. What happens right now? I mean, that is a great point because, I mean, not a great point, but it's a great idealism for this because there's no fucking way that you can carry that with you, which so many people have, yeah. you know, after a bad scene or a failed scene. Mm -hmm. Because if you carry it with you, which most people do, right, your next scene, yeah. the pressure is 10 times worse. Yeah. And you're almost like you've been, um, your manhood has been taken. Yeah. Right? Well, it's, like, it's like what they say, in, you know, you're a boxer. If you've gotten knocked out once, your body never forgets, you know, the feeling of being knocked out. You never do, do you fully get by having been knocked out unconscious, you know what I'm saying? Because they say that until it has happened, you're less likely to, you know, it, it, it's not, it's, it's like, it's not, it's like once it happens, once it can happen again, yeah. easier than it happening the first time, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So, um. Um, and I've had some, you know, I've had some epic 
I've had some monumental failures. Really? Oh man! Like I mean, like the scale of which would, is a, would you know like? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow, man! Like I fucking um did this uh uh not the Venus Convention in in Berlin, but I did this convention in Zurich, Switzerland. Their wow. big one, right? They have a big one out there called the um. Um, I forget what it's called, but 3,000 people in an arena, and uh, there was a whole storyline to the scene I was supposed to come in, and the girl that I was working with, I didn't know who she was at the tool she was going to be, but on the Friday afternoon, the girl on the stage was lifting 10-pound weights with her pussy lips, and her pussy lips were hanging down oh. to three, four inches, right? Oh. And I saw that, and I was like, Ugh. Man, no way, right? So the next Saturday, so the next day, Saturday, like I'm dressed up like a fucking gladiator, and I was supposed to come out to the fucking music and shit, and like the the woman that was orchestrating the whole scenes, like the biggest dominatrix in Germany, and I was supposed to. So when I found out who the girl was, it was the girl from the last day with the little pussy lips, and I was like, oh, right. So I remember, like, there was a ramp that led up to the opening where you go onto the stage, and I'm at the bottom of the ramp, and I'm, like, fucking sweating. You know what I'm saying? I would have, you know, let me tell you something. If someone would have given me, like, a handful of pills, like Skittles, I would have took them all. But it would have been too late anyway, because it would have been, like, 20 minutes to kick in. I would have fucking bombed and left the stage with a heart on. <laughs> right? <laughs> So I remember the, the, the curtains opened up at the top of the ramp and it was like, it was like the fucking movie Gladiator where like he's at the bottom of the fucking ramp and, he, and they open up and he's just like, and then runs up the, the, the ramp and it's like, dun, dun, dun. man, I went out there. My shit was like, fucking, I couldn't find my dick, man. And, um, I, so it was like 3,000 people, man. 3,000 people, that's rough, man. That's and I was like, if you don't, let me tell you something, if you, don't, if you don't have it going before you go out there, you're not going to get it going. But your mind's not yeah, going. Yeah, man, so imagine I'm at the bottom of the ramp, I see myself like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. There's, there's no, and you, what are you going to do? You can't, like. <laughs> you can't go nowhere. You can't not go. <laughs> <laughs> the music playing and I went up the ramp and went out there like uh, so what happened was is the dominatrix uh, Dominique Insomnia is her name incredible woman she ended up telling me to go to the back of the fucking stage she strapped on a dildo and fucked the girl uh -huh. so can you imagine the you know me with my ego and shit I'm Lexa Steele I'm over here in fucking Zurich right and I'm getting fucking sent to the back row of the stage by the fucking, by the director, by the the woman of the scene. And she fu actually fucks the girl I was supposed to fuck. So long story short, they had Brazilian dancers in the back row of the stage, right? Ah, super hot. So I went to the back of the stage because I wasn't allowed to leave the stage, but which probably was more embarrassing because I had to, I couldn't leave the stage, right? So I'm back there, but you know, I'm just with the Brazilian dancers and my shit is like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sitting there with a fucking bat like this, right? By the end of the episode, because of the, because of the dance, the Brazilian, I mean, these girls were like fucking like, and so I just remember the look that she gave me because I had the one, I was like, I had the one by the waist and my shit was just like on her back like this. <laughs> And I just remember her look at me like with this look of disdain, you know, like, <laughs> you know, but what are you going to do? Um, um, but yeah, man, so I've had some epic, um, you know, but I mean, there's been some incredible performances that are memorable too, you know? Yeah. That's, uh, you know what's for me, sometimes the Europe is kind of strange sometimes. Yeah. I felt one time, you know, I'll give you an example. I felt something like that, but not. That's a heavy duty pressure, 3,000 mm. people. Yeah. So you really got, your mind's got to be there. Yeah. And if it's a girl you don't like, well, yeah. I understand, you know? I've been there. Yeah. The girls, it's, you know, this is the truth. I like my girls, majority, most of the time, mm -hmm. brown or black. And you probably know that, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
And they always stuck me with the whitest girls. And yeah. some are beautiful, and I loved them. You know well, I mean? most, of them were, most of them were beautiful. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not, not in my eyes, right? You know what I mean? Well, they put, I'm just they put you, you'd always have the, the, the hottest contract girl. No, 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 no. Before in the early days, okay. I was the guy that can fuck everything. Okay. And a lot of guys kind of didn't want to fuck these girls. Mm-hmm. So I would get stuck with girls that a lot of guys didn't want to fuck. And I'd fuck them. You know what I mean? Because I could, yeah. you know, do it, you know? But... I've been there with girls, you know, that I'm not really into. Mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. I mean? But there was one time when I went to Spain for a German company. I just got off the plane. Not really, you know, you are you need a little, it's a long flight, right? Yeah. Whatever. We went to Spain from L.A. to Spain, then went to Ibiza, right? So mm-hmm. we ended up in a Ibiza, long drive through Ibiza to get to the top of the mountain, whatever, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Long, whatever, 15, 16, 17 hours. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of young. 1992, right? And they put me right away into a scene. As soon as you rolled up. As soon as I rolled up, <laughs> right? They put me with Roberto Malone, who was an egomaniac, right? Mm-hmm. Italian egomaniac, nice guy, but we know the Europeans. Yeah. They want to make very... you. They want to make you look like shit sometimes. Yeah. You know, see who's the man. So. Yeah. They want to compete, like and, yeah. And they had this German girl who was hairy. You know, not my style, really. Oh, no, I like, she no, hair no, all over? Yeah, hair oh, legs. Okay, okay, okay. But not really a hairy gorilla, but, you know, just. Yeah, just there. She's just, like, yeah. I couldn't appreciate it, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And she was okay looking, but I couldn't appreciate it. So here's Roberto already fucking him, a big hard eye. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm walking into the scene with these Nazis, right, because it's a German production. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck, right? You know, I'm still, for, I'm two years deep, right? Mm. A little over two years deep. So you still, you know. You got to know how to fight in different situations. Yeah. That's the art of being a performer. Yeah. Right? And so he got me for a, a little bit, you know, but I got going. You know, yeah. I did my job. Yeah. You know, but it was, a, it was a pressure. But then after that, we did a scene, me and him and another girl. I had to tell you. You annihilated him? I fucked him up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Don't fuck with me. <laughs> yeah, like, gave you a chance, like, okay, now I've had a chance to decompose. Now that we're on equal footing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm relaxed, and there's a girl yeah. I can appreciate, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and guess what? I fucked him up bad. Yeah. <laughs> right, he was done. Shit. But anyway, yeah. but I understand because that was a similar, nothing like 3,000 people is crazy. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's, yeah. That's crazy. You really yeah. got to be, people got to know. You think it's easy? No. Yeah. If 3,000 people looking at your nuts and you don't even know them and they want to, you know, who knows yeah. what and they're it, thinking in their head and yeah. the noise and stuff is. Yeah, oh, my God. And you're on a stage. The people are right there. You can, and then the thing is, is like, um, you know, like when you're, when you're in the moment, as an athlete, yeah, and shit can get quiet where you actually, you're, you're like, you put, you know, like, okay, as a boxer, right? When you're boxing, um, regardless of how many people were, were in, in the gym or in the arena where you were boxing, right? You could hear your coach, right? Out of a, all these people hollering and screaming, right? But you can identify your coach, right? your, your coach's voice, right? Oh. Well, it would be like that um, when you're performing at a certain point everything gets super quiet in your in your mind so you got to be able to tune into the the right wavelength because just like you can hear your coach screaming within a, a hundred people screaming when you're doing scenes you could hear the guy with the camera breathing like or you could hear someone switch from leaning on their right side to leaning on their left side and readjusting the hold of the microphone because they're waiting on you. And it's that hypersensitivity, like even even down to feeling like um, when the girl's pussy begins to get a little drier and you're, you're thinking to yourself like, damn, like, okay, am I taking, is it me? Am I taking, you know, <laughs> am I taking a long time here? So yeah, man, it's, it's a lot that goes into the mental part of it. Oh um, yeah, it can get pretty. Yeah. It gets pretty crazy. But but the, but I think it's it's some of the ingredients that that make for a, a, a long lasting reputation, you know what I'm saying? That um, that you could at least say in this particular media, I did something that I'd be remembered. Yeah, for sure. You know? I was one of the main reasons I was good because I had a very very strong mental focus. Mm-hmm. Really, I could focus all these things out 
Yeah. You know, and I learned how to become even stronger with it, you know, but always had like, you know, laser mm -hmm. vision. But anyways, so you were a professional athlete almost pretty much, kind yeah. of, right on the borderline. Man, right? yeah. Kind of. So would you say that this job is more difficult than being a goalie in a high pressure situation? Or is it um, well, well, for me, I would say that um, the job is, um, as a male performer, is, is definitely a lot more pressure. Um, because although being a goalkeeper, you can't make a mistake because your, your mistakes are immediately be accountable, but you still have 10 other people working with you. When you're a male performer, it's, it's kind of like being a boxer or, uh, or a mixed martial artist where it's you, generally it's you and your counterpart, yeah. right? And no one can save you. Now, now, now in, in, in those cases, your counterpart is an opponent. In our case, our counterpart is, should be working with us to achieve the common goal. So I think um, part of being good at what we did was that we were able to make sure our, counterpart, our counterparts were our friends and not our opponents. You know what I'm saying? And that allows for a better scene, a more memorable scene. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people take for granted that um, um, however we're doing it, every guy is is trying to get a chemical establishment with that girl from the moment they, either whether they know each other or not. You could have worked with a girl a million times, right? But just that one time when she had a fucked up morning, the last thing she wants to see is some guy that's going to be banging the hell out of her, but it's you that walk in. And she's like, oh, it's CT. Okay, we're going to, okay, so the rest of the day is going to be good from here. But there's times when you walk in the room and you can tell there's nothing you can do to change that girl, <laughs> that girl's mind. And you're like, oh, man. But the truth is that you don't like everybody. No, you, no, no. no. Let's get it no. straight. They might look good on camera, but you're not attracted to everybody. You know what Sometimes I mean? you arrive early and you wish you got there a little late. Like, <laughs> damn, you know, like, <laughs> perhaps I should come back. <laughs> you know? Well, I tell you what I used to do. I used to hide because I don't want to talk to anybody. Mm. Right? I wanted to be organically exciting because yeah. sometimes I know it's the girl. Yeah. And I'm not really looking forward to it. You know, I work with Melanie Moore, who is a very nice person. Mm -hmm. You know, just not my style. Yeah. But very nice and very easy to work with. Mm -hmm. 50 times. I work with Debbie Diamond 40 times. Mm -hmm. She's great. Yeah. But you think I'm into six foot tall Amazons? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I need yeah, a girl of my size. Yeah. I'm small, you know yeah. what I mean? You know, I gotta use, you know, I don't mind using my energy, but yeah. you know what I mean? I just give you an example, right? And uh, you know, and I work with a lot of girls 30 plus times. So you like. Yeah. Right? Well, I'm, you got to find something every time. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So what, when, when did it come to you? You know, how old were you? When did you make your decision and say, I got to get into the business? Mm. I'm going to do it. And how was it presented to you? Um, I was, okay. So <clears throat> let me see. Um, um, I was 26 when I did my first start, when I first started doing scenes. Um, I was three years out of college and, um, you know, I was a, a, a working um, stockbroker with a Wall Street um, um, investment bank. Um, I spent a few years in uh, Tower 2, a World Trade Center, um, with a bigger firm the last couple of years of, 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 of being a broker. Um, but how I got started was uh, crazy. See, not for nothing, but I didn't, when I was a broker, I didn't know that the way those guys were maintaining their energy levels was cocaine based. Believe it or not, like, I didn't find out. Like the Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. Like, I didn't, in all honesty, I didn't know, I didn't find out about cocaine use as, as, as a broker until I saw um, Wolf of Wall Street. And Matthew McConaughey was explaining to Leonardo DiCaprio about using coke. And then it dawned on me, like, damn, you're going to tell me back from 93 to 98 how those dudes were getting amped up at, like, 8 p.m. was because they were going downstairs to do a couple lines and then come back upstairs and, and, and really, really, you know, um, and, and kill it, you know. So I didn't know about that. So I didn't find out about that shit until after I had been, 
been done being a broker, you know. So you, <laughs> you missed out. I missed out. I probably would have been a lot better like they were. But um, so what happened was, anyway, long story short, when I got licensed to be a broker, that was when I was exposed to a lot of the recreations that those guys were always doing. See what I'm saying? Like if I wasn't a money maker, um, they weren't going. They weren't going to look at you the same way, and then have you enter into their world away from the office. So when I got licensed, when I became now I was an earner. Now it's like okay, boom. You know, there's this event happening this weekend. If you want to go, or this dude is having this at his yacht or his penthouse. You know what I'm saying? So when I when I was licensed, I was invited to um, a gangbang. Really? I, yeah, I didn't know it was a gangbang. A um, gangbang with the stockbrokers, or a, yeah, a gangbang was a gangbang that was like five or six dudes from our firm, and um, about twenty other guys and one chick. Twenty <laughs> five guys. It was, yeah, man. It was guys were lined up around the walls. What the fuck? In the suite. They were a lot of them coked up, or what? I'm sure they. I'm sure they were. I did. I did that night. I don't know. Of uh, anybody was, you know, but all I know was like when I got there, I was like, holy shit, this is one of those things I've only read about. You know what wow. I'm saying? And uh, and so, yeah. And so anyway, I, got, I met a dude that was there that um, um, was like, yo, you should think about doing some work. And then I started doing magazines in New York. I did pretty much all the black magazines, hardcore. So you... Well, say that part again. You were in the gangbang, and they said you should do magazines. Yeah, there was one dude that was in the gangbang that was like, "Yo, have you ever thought about doing this? You know, prof- or you know, professionally? You know." Um, and I was like, "No," but I said to myself, "Would I do it if given the opportunity?" And it was the first time I ever said yes to something like that. So I did. Ma- I, I started doing magazines probably in like maybe ninety four, ninety five. How did you get to, to be in a magazine? How were you introduced to someone that shot? Well, film? well, one of the guys was um, he also did those magazines like was it was like Black Tail or Black Lust. A guy or, in the in the gangbang. That was at the gangbang. Yeah, the brother that was at the gangbang was one of the dudes that did the uh, the hardcore photo shoots for a lot of the black magazines. So he was like, "Do you want?" He said, "Would you would you be interested in doing this?" I was like, "Yeah." So I got his number, and then we we were able to um, to catch up. And I started doing. Um, we used to do these things. Um, we had this group this group called the Gentle Giants, and we would travel all the way up in north or south along the eastern seaboard, hosting um, um, swinger parties. So all this happened from this gangbang. Where I met, you know, the guy that got me into magazines, the guy that ended up getting me into doing the swing, the swinger, the swinger shit, uh, which led to doing movies, you know. And so by the time I, I met a movie producer, um, I was really, really comfortable with, with doing movies because whenever we would do these swing parties, whether it was in New Hampshire, I was from New Jersey, whether we were in New Hampshire or Virginia, um, all these parties the husbands would all have the camcorders, right? And so the husbands would, would, they wouldn't care about fucking, they would be caring about capturing their wife getting fucked by five or six, you know, BBCs, right? And we were the gentle giants. It was like five, you know, five, you know, you know, five black guys, all of us had big dicks. And um, um, it would generally be, um, you know, these interracial swing parties. And um, there would be other types of women there as well, but it's primarily, you know, the BBCs being matched up with the wives of, you know. Wow, that's a trip. So it was really the attraction was the gentle giants, big black dicks. Mm -hmm. And you come, your wife's going to get banged out. Oh, yeah. Stretched out. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Like a plant. We call it plantation parties. Because it was like, it was always be like the white, you know, the white woman or husband. And it was like, we were like, you know, yeah, ironically enough, looking back on it, it was like a plantation where you'd have like we were like the mandingo, <laughs> the mandingos, right? I'm saying you know, uh, uh, entertaining the, you know the the aristocracy, you know what I'm saying the white aristocracy, and um, um, not much has changed. <laughs> but, you know what I'm saying? Lionel <laughs> Richie said that at his concert. 
<laughs> not much has changed. Uh, so, you know, uh, but that's how I got started. Or, or, or that's a lot of stuff that poured into why I was able to hit the ground running. Wow, that's a great um, entryway, a great training ground. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. You're fucking in front of all these people. But that is a strange thing. I don't really get it, man. Between me and you, I don't get why guys want to see their girls get banged out. I don't want my girl being banged out by anybody. <laughs> Much less a guy's dick that's twice the size of mine, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, well, you know what? I told a friend of mine this other day. You know, um, a lot of the swingers' lifestyle is uh, um, um, it's a rec it's a recreation activity, right? And I think it's um, you get to the point where you get to get into a circle that people are able to recreationally have sex in front of you. So it's like if you're in that circle where what, what you know, like we like to go bowling, well, we like to go to swinger parties, and at swinger parties, we like watching the wife you get banged out now me personally i've never been one to be like ah it's like look you know i'll i'll I, i'll bang her i'll bang yours as well um if 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 you want to bang mine i'm cool with that too if we're at a swingers party but i'm not one to sit on the sidelines and watch someone do damage by himself you know what i'm saying i mean we could all fuck you know what I'm saying? But yeah, yes, yeah. so I've never, you know, and I, I, I've definitely been the guy that um, has been doing a lot of the fucking, as, as you know, like in these situations where someone is either paying us to fuck their wife um, or their girlfriend, you know, and um, um, I had a lot of experience with that too. So that's that's a cool story though. Yeah. Was there any good pussy? You know, good walls in there. Well, you know, the thing is, is, is a lot of the swinger shit is, is, um, is condom, you know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah. over the, you know, it's a lot of fun, but you miss out on, on generally like really, really, you know, because like while, while you are having sex with someone's wife, they don't want to get pregnant. Want, they don't necessarily want to get pregnant while they're swinging. So a lot of stuff was, was condom. So I can't say that I had a lot of, I have a lot of memories, um, doing a lot of the swinger lifestyle shit. Um, you know, because almost 90% of it has been kind of... Well, you appreciate sensitivity. You appreciate yeah. good pussy. Yeah. You definitely can't feel a good pussy with a condom. Or if you can, you really can't feel how really good it is. Yeah, you don't really... Yeah, like, 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 you know, it's just a notion of do you know or do you, you know, how, do you really know what someone's, right. you know, what a girl feels like? Yeah, and, you, know. you, you really want to spend an hour, two hours banging with a condom? Or, yeah. Does anybody know what your dick looks like afterwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it gets beat up. And, and plus, too, a lot of, a lot of females, um, you know, a lot of the women, they don't necessarily, and, and with people, you know, a lot of people that are conservative, I get it, but, but they're taking for, fuck that. Women will tell you themselves that they don't like condoms. It drives their pussy. It drives their, rips their pussy from the inside out, right? Yeah. And, and it's like when you think about it, you know, um, unless a woman is well lubricated, that is going to be damaging. She's going to be uncomfortable, with, you know, being penetrated with the condom. And so, and whether you, you know, so likewise with men. So it's kind of like um, it's a necessary thing. And, and <clears throat> I don't, you know, fault anyone for saying, hey, I prefer a condom, you know, and if so, I, I, I make use of them, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? But knock on wood, um, you know, uh, um, in most cases, it's like, yo, like if if she's like, yo, you don't need that. I mean, <laughs> I've been one to be whether like, all right, well, I'm going in. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, me. Yeah, like, you know, hey, you know, and that's the thing about it. It's like, look. You know what? Um, part of the element of doing this is you got to be a swashbuckler, man. Yeah. You got to be willing, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, man. You know, you don't got to be like suicidal, but you got to be a fire in the hole type motherfucker. You got to be like, words. She's fucking. And then we're fucking. You can't be in this business in our time, yeah. or my time, and your time. Because you're part yeah. of the time. Yeah. If you're not really, really, genuinely. In love with pussy. Yeah. And the girls. You know, the whole... I love girls. Yeah. The beautiful girls. I mean, do you ever look at a girl sometimes and just say... 
and your blood starts boiling, you know, and you're like a little on fire, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. The older you get, the less fire you'll have yeah. usually, but, you know, when you feel that, oh. oh my God, there's two, t like, Naomi Banks was one. Um, is she good? Oh my God. Yeah. Naomi is like, Oh, sexy. One of the few, like, yeah, she's one of the few people that I would say are literally awesome. Like, you know, a 10 in every regard, you know what I'm saying? And then, you know, and then there's women that, that are just awesome people. Sarah J and I have had a relationship for 17 years, you know, and she's always been an awesome person. A relationship, yeah. friendly relationship? Yeah, we've been close off, you know, we've been not only, you know, very good working together on camera, we've been very, very close off camera as well, because you develop friendships. Okay. Oh, yeah, you know. Yeah. All, and, all the above. Yeah, all the above. And certain people are genuinely fine people. And so you end up having a friendship, or more or less even, you know, for a long time, you know. She's very nice. Very yeah, nice. She's, you know, so she's super cool. So there's, there's, um, um, is her pussy good? Yeah, yeah, she's fantastic. You know what I'm saying? But, um, I mean, yeah, but Naomi. Um, she has something about her sexy, statuesque yeah. feel. She, she, for me, she was <clears throat> she was the ultimate. <clears throat> certain girls, you know, would, or certain girls manifest the ultimate of a type of girl. And so for me, like, Naomi, for me, was the greatest um, black woman I've ever encountered in my whole life, and that and that means wow. in in every aspect. Um, there were white girls that were the embodiment of of you know the most fantastic white girl I've ever met in my life. You know, Kiara Mia remains the greatest Latina um, sister I've ever met in my life. And like, so when you're talking about losing it, Naomi and I would have a spark that would um, already be there before. But one thing I noticed with Kiara is um, there was one time where Kiara, where I literally came out of some sort of um, emotional space where I was like, yo, hold up. I'm literally murdering this girl. Like, I, I lost it. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, man, man, yeah, man, where you're like, holy shit. And like, you kind of like, you like, your eyes kind of refocus. And you're like, whoa, you got to hold up, hold up, hold up. And what it was is, I came out of this trance and I looked at her face and I saw the way she was looking up at me and I was like, oh my God. Like, I'm like, what am I doing? Really? To oh my God, man. Yo. Would you consider pussies a hell of a drug? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is that part of this? I mean, uh, let me tell you something. It's, yeah, man. It was, yeah, it was one of those cases where you find yourself thinking like, I'm, I was losing and no one told me I had lost it because when I looked at her face, I'm thinking to myself, like, what am I doing to her to have her looking at me like that? But she was enjoying it or? Oh, yeah. Awesome? Kiara, she could, you know, she, you know, she, she yeah, she, yeah, yeah. She, poof. But I mean, like, yeah, man, she, I literally was like, whoa, you know, I literally was like, yo, get a grip. Mm -hmm. To myself. <laughs> uh, uh, well, sounds good. Yeah, sometimes you gotta tell yourself, yo, man. So, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying anything else. <laughs> How did you get your name, your stage name? Ah, uh, oh well. All right. You know, how people have the bullshit stories about like, oh, you gotta be like your first pet, and your. My story is like, um, um. So there was a, a couple guys who had the last name Steele that were in the business before, or the existence of Steele as a last name for dudes existed. Really? Who? Before, like, I mean, was it Jeremy? Yeah, you're right. Little twerpy yeah. guy. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, he got smart with me one time. And there's a, <laughs> <laughs> no, but there was not only him, but there was, you know, it, it lent itself to a male, a guy's last name. Uh -huh. And then um, um, I was at the time I was still a broker, and I was I went up to, from I worked downtown, but I went up to Midtown to meet a client, and I got off the subway at the corner of of Lexington and Madison, and I had to think about my names, and then I saw the the sign that said Lexington, I was like Lexington Steel, and I was like ooh, I cut in half Lex Steel that sounds cool or Lexington Steel that's cool or just Lexington or just Lex, and it, it made sense. So I just went for Lex and Steel. So um, 
Um, cause I, what happened was, is I did one photo shoot and they gave me a name and it was a fucked up name. <laughs> like what? They called me Oswald Simpson. Oh, right? Fuck. What the fuck, right? So I was like, like I was is like, that two killers in one name? Yeah, right. So you got it, right? It was, you know, I'm like, what the fuck, right now? But I was like, look, I was like, never again am I gonna let, um, you know, someone else pick my name. So I had something coming up within a few days, in, I think that weekend, and I was like, I have to have my own name by the time I go for that photo shoot. So that's how there was a little bit of urgency for me coming up with Lexus, you know, coming up with my own name, you know. I like the name. It's cool. Yeah. It's yeah. definitely a unique and individual name. You know, stands yeah. out. Yeah. So I, you know, the, the, you know. So that's how that happened. It was really just a case of, I, I, you know, a pre-existing last name, and then something I just stumbled upon my first name. So yeah. I want to um, let's go back, man. Let's go back. Let people understand more. I mean, you give me a lot, Lex. When were you born? Where were you? You said Jersey. Were you born in Jersey? Yeah, Risley, um, Risley, Jersey, Jersey dude. Um, you know, and I grew up in like a, a small city in New Jersey and, um, um, you know, didn't go too far. Well, went far away for college, then came back and went closer. Uh, to a spot closer, so I've seen a couple different cities up and down the East Coast. Um, you know, uh, um, I went to to Morehouse College in Atlanta. You know, for two and a half years, and transferred to Syracuse, which is in upstate New York, and finished up at Syracuse. Uh, my sister went to Northeastern, which is in Boston. So I'm kind of an East Coast guy with a lot of roots, you know, um, on the East Coast. When I moved to L.A., I moved here by myself, you know, and, and really, I quit my job, brought, you know, and, and brought everything out here uh, in March of 98. And um, so when I moved out here in March of 98, I said, look, I said, you know, um, I knew that I could return to, to Wall Street because uh, my licensing uh, was going to be good for two more years from my, la my last transaction, my last execution. I had two years that my license was still be validated. And um, uh, so I said, okay, I said, I'll know by then whether I could do this or not. You know what I'm saying? But I, and I had a couple bucks saved up so I could live um, until I gained traction. You know. So you went to college. But in the early years when you're in school, you know, what kind of student were you? What kind of guy were you? You know what I mean? Quiet, extrovert, introvert. You seem a little introverted to me. No, nah, no. Nah. Like, I no? mean, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Here we go. No. Let's go. <laughs> no, nah, like, you know, no, nah, I mean, when I was in college, uh, um, no, nah, I was, shit, man. I had a great college experience where, like, you know, um, yeah, I played college sports. I played soccer at Syracuse. Um, um, you know, I'm in a fraternity. Um, I had, so I had every aspect of, of, you know what I'm saying? Like when I went to Morehouse, um, you know, I experienced and learned from the competitive environment that, that being at a, um, HBC, historically black college, the competitiveness of going to a school like that academically, socially, mm -hmm. economically. Um, and then when I went to Syracuse, I experienced, uh, uh what it was like to be with, a girl that was exploring elements of her sexuality because she never had sex with a black guy before from where she came from. So when she got to Syracuse, it was her first time exploring that she always wanted to have sex with a black guy. Um, I've seen that. Um, you know, I've had the, the um, um, a lot of fun um, um, through the college years. And so, um, and then, and then, and then the excitement of, of getting becoming a, a financial professional um, as an you know as an investment advisor, you know, um, a lot of pressure. You know, what I'm saying when the money that you're, you're you're discussing is real. You know, what I'm saying like I, I've, you know, um, you know, I've had a lot of wins. I've had a lot of losses where, 
you know, the money's exchanged were serious monies. I mean, like I've had, you know, $287,000 transaction that went against me, you know, and I had to make that phone call. <laughs> so, you know, it's like I, I definitely had a lot of experiences that, that, you know, were before porno that, you know, have been as significant. The tattoo on your arm. Yeah. Is that from college? Oh, well, oh you mean oh, my no, brand? Yeah, the brand. Excuse yeah, me. yeah. It's Omega Sci-Fi. Um, I have five brands. I have two on my right arm, um, two on my left calf, and one on my right calf. And um, and then and then I got seven tattoos. Because people forget I'm tat I got tats too. <clears throat> but the brand. So what is the, what do they mean? Well, it's the it's the actual it's an actual Omega. And and um, the actual branding is in a, you know uh, an homage um, uh, to uh, scarification of um, which is a, a part of the of African culture, um, <clears throat> and which is called scarification, where they actually um, beautify and decorate their skin by scars. Now, if you if you take uh, the Yoruba, Yoruba tradition of scarification and you look at the fact that as African slaves, we were branded by our slave masters for identification purposes. Um, we take back that, we juxtapose that against scarification and thereby own the branding instead of it being something of remembrance of being branded slaves, but a scarification uh, cultural technique by our African ancestors. So well, that's the, the, you know, the, the, the PC version of it, you know. How they, so. how they do it? Well, I can't really, you know what I'm saying? I mean, people, let me play this. No, people will see. I, I, you, it's, it is what it is. I mean, like, definitely, like, <clears throat> without going how we prepare ours, there's really only one way to do it. Burn. Yeah, it, yeah. You know, and it's, it's, um, it's real. Yeah, yeah. I, have, I have something right here. Maybe not as deep as yours. Mm -hmm. Obviously not as deep as yours. Mm -hmm. But I was in front of Jim South, mm -hmm. you know, world modeling. And I took a hanger. Yeah. And I burnt this girl's <laughs> name right under my arm with the hanger. <laughs> yeah. Fire coming up. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And your skin's like wax. It just melts off. So, you know. It smells like, it smells like bacon. <laughs> yeah, nobody did it for I just yeah. did it for myself. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Nah, you know, like my shit, um, you know, I'm not the only uh, fraternity. Uh, my fraternity is not the only one that does it. Um, most of, if not all, the black fraternities do it. Um, you know, as a, as a, you know, as an homage to our African ancestors. Uh, um, and <clears throat> the reason why I bring that or, or putting it that way is um, just as long as people don't make the misconception that um, we're doing it as an homage to being branded as slaves. We're taking a, a practice that was inflicted. And it's Black History Month, so I'm giving some Black History, I guess. No, bring it. No. You know, it's like not everybody you know, knows. Yeah, you know, it's like so. If you look at you know the history of being branded as slaves, we just brought it back um, and said, hey, you know what? Um, this is a, a celebration of our you know our ancestry for beautifying ourselves with with scarification. Yeah. Yeah. I I think it was kind of fun when I branded myself. Yeah, nah. <laughs> Did it hurt you? Did it hurt or just for like uh, a minute or something? I mean, yeah, but it was, you know, I mean, it's, it's quick. Yeah. It's quick, you know, and, and um, um, you know, for me, um, when I've, you know, like I said, I have five of them, so, um, you know, I've always, my old thing was a preparation beforehand because you could feel it from pretty far away. You know what I'm saying? So, like, you know, you, you have a moment to contemplate. <laughs> you have enough time to contemplate what's about to happen before it happens. But, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I would say um, I would do, I would brand again before I would get another tattoo. Why? Because, man, I, I, I mean, unless, unless the, the, maybe they have numbing agents that have gotten better since my last tattoo, but I couldn't sit through it again. Like, I got half sleeves on both arms, and it, if I got them done again, they would look so dope. If I if I could just sit back in the chair, but I can't. You got to drink. D drink, nah, man. <laughs> I would have to. Well, you know what? I, nah, nah. I mean, because alcohol thins the blood, right? Uh, 
Maybe. Yeah, does it not? Does it? Yeah. I think so. I, I might be wrong, but I think so. And so then you bleed more because you have less um, uh-huh. coagulation you know, um, uh, with the thinner blood. But no, nah, I'm just thinking that I know back in the day when I did mine, I think you had certain creams or sprays, but it was so long ago that maybe now they've got to have improved the technology because I, mean, I, could, I, could, I could, like I said, I could sit through, I could do another brand, but I could not. I could not stand getting my brands, my my tattoos retouched as much as I'd like to. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, back to school, when you were younger, that's mm-hmm. what I was thinking. When you were younger, what type of student were you? Let's say, <laughs> let's say junior high school to high school. You know, what kind of student were you? You went to college, so you had to be yeah. fairly good and focused. But what what type of guy were you? You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I was. Um, in, before, through, before high school and in, in high school, I was always a popular kid. You know, um, um, always in the middle of everything. You know, I participated as a kid playing all different types of sports. Um, I had kid friends of of every race, from every neighborhood, from every economic um, um, distinction. Um, it was a wonderful childhood. You know, what I'm saying like Brady Bunch. You know, Cosby Kid type of. You know, like. Well, Cosby um, Kid, in my opinion, they had some money. Yeah, but but I mean, it was still you know. But the Cosby, the Cosby fan, like they never, their money was never a part of their makeup. I mean, you knew right. that just because the father was a doctor, the mother was an attorney, you knew that they were of money, but they didn't come across as being moneyed. Right, right. But you I'm know. saying your so your social economic status in the household was. Pretty good. Well, I would say we were we were middle class Black Americans, a middle class Black Black American family. And if you look at that on an economics and an economically um, an economically configured um, uh, uh, you know mode of looking at it, um, at that time I would say we were maybe lower middle class in terms of household median income if you include white American. Um, so we were, we, we were, we were, we were pretty, you know, like we lived pretty well as black Americans and that put us maybe at the lower end of the middle class American mm-hmm. lifestyle. So, um, like I said, I had all types of kids that lived around me and, and, uh, my neighborhood, um, what hood was this exactly? What town yeah. or what neighborhood? I grew up in a town called Morris town. M O double R I S C O W N. I say that because there's another town called Morristown, which is in South New Jersey and right across from Philly. So I have to make the distinction Morris. So it was like, you know, every type of family, every type of kid. That's why, like, I never grew up, um, you know, I never grew up as a racist or, or experiencing racism. Um, I experienced this with white kids from the beginning, Asian kids, Latina kids, black kids. It was uh, it was never something that was an issue with me. I didn't really deal with um, you know racial shit, so to speak, until I got to Wall Street, and then uh, and then obviously once I got into porno. But but um, all the way up through high school and college, I mean, I never experienced any type of ill will towards me based on race. Oh, that's cool. Not that it didn't exist, but it was just that. Um, you know, um, the East Coast, and especially anywhere in the New York Tri-State area, everybody smashed together. Mm. So if you can't deal with, um, if you can't deal with, you know, a Latino uh, brother that's right next to you, and if you can't deal with the Jewish white kid that's right on your left of you, then it's not them that's a problem; it's you that's a problem. Mm. So it was like I, I got a good, you know, a, a good, a good foundation where, like, you know, what I'm saying it was all about who the individual was. And um, and it also gave me like the, the skin necessary to be able to to deal with certain things that would happen later on. From from what I understand, you know, and I'm not a historian, you mm-hmm. know what I mean. New York, even way back, mm-hmm. right? Let's say 150 or more years ago. Yeah. Before the Civil War, let's go farther. 170, yeah. 180 years, mm-hmm. right? There was black businesses that were owned by black men, black yeah. people, yeah. right? That were doing business already. Yeah. So it wasn't the same as the South. 
No. The mentality wasn't the same. And I don't, a lot of people might not know that. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you agree with me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So racism in the South is because it seems like there was a lot of ignorant people over there. Mm -hmm. And they had slavery, which was ridiculous, right? Yeah. But there was other places in America that I thought there wasn't so much this way. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you agree or not? Well, well yeah, yeah, I remember like what happened was, um, um, if you look in the in the, the tri-state area, the northeastern part of, of the country, you know, uh, uh, the relationship or the, 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 the menu, the ingredients that made Americans American in that part of the country at that time was not based on um, a racial designation uh, for the economy. Okay, but if you go, the more south you go, south of what became the Mason-Dixon line, the basis for those states' economies was on was on crops, whether it was cotton, tobacco, um, sugar, even timber. So the basis of your economy is a labor-intensive mechanism of, of action that was necessary for people to work and for it to be economically feasible. You had to have cheap labor. So that was the basis of slavery was cheap labor or labor that you literally didn't pay for. You purchased one time and that's paid for again. Uh, in the Northeast, the, the economics weren't based on a, a production of, of certain, certain goods that require certain types of labor to produce. So, so you didn't have a necessity for slavery in the northern parts of the country. And that's why it, it, it never really caught on. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so black Americans were in those parts of the country from the very, very beginning, going as far back as the first arrivals of, of when Europeans started coming here and the, and the indigenous peoples that were here for thousands of years, you know, accepted the white people coming from Europe and then it began to accept the, the black people that had been, been coming from Africa for hundreds of years. See, people forget Africans were coming to this hemisphere for thousands of years. They may not have came all the way up the eastern seaboard, but we were all over South America and, and um, maybe as far north as Florida. If you look at the Seminole Indians out of Florida, um, the Seminole Indians, modern day, pe modern day people that will say modern day Seminole Indian is based on the combination of escaped slaves from coming down into Florida and Southern northern Florida and central Florida and then uh, mixing with the indigenous natives um, from that region well well, there were Africans that had made their way up across from uh, Africa and then South America and up into that part of the region that were there before the, before the cross um, assassination of African slaves uh, or slaves with the indigenous Native Americans. I've heard this you know I've yeah. heard this before you know and a lot of people don't understand that I think yeah yeah. But I think it's pretty factual, huh? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, so so that's why I think, you know, yeah, it's like if you look at the South, um, why there's why there's that, that the situation that became um, uh, something that has stained the United States forever. And I think uh, we got a long way to go. Um, and as far as, with it, you know, the industry, um, and as you know, you know, it's, you can attest, you know, the, the European chicks that come over to work over here, they never have a problem doing, you know, doing brothers, you know what I'm saying? Um, and it's, even Canadian chicks don't have a problem. And so it's really an American problem. Um, and I think, you know. I mean, before you got in the business, yeah. it was more of a problem. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I saw Shawn Michaels. Yeah. Sweet talk, these girls, you know. You know, it, it's obviously it's from majority I believe mm -hmm. from their childhood their upbringing you know the girls you yeah. know what I mean As they're taught this and that and they don't really understand everything because if you have, if you're an intelligent person and you understand people or yeah. just just a life how the fuck <laughs> can no, you be, you know how the fuck can you be racist right doesn't make any sense yeah, yeah. so but what my point is, is I saw Shawn Michaels numerous times yeah the girls had a misconception probably from their upbringing, mm -hmm. right? Or, or you never know, you go in the wrong hood, who knows? Yeah. You know, I mean, anything's possible. The, the guys want to 
grab your ass or you know whistle mm -hmm. you or whatever you know i don't know about that that's not what i'm talking about yeah. what i'm talking about is the family would give you a misconception of a person yeah. a black person or even uh, some latin people mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. you know it's just the way it is right yeah and when Shawn michaels would meet these girls and talk to them because you know, he, he speaks very well yeah yeah. Very, he holds himself very well, yeah. right? Dresses very well. Yeah. He's a good guy, nice yeah. guy. The girls would be like, oh, I yeah. didn't know. Yeah, you motherfuckers, you didn't know. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? It's the black people are aliens? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like crazy, right? So, But I have seen Shawn Michaels yeah. the wonders back then. But I guess it's just all the misconception. And sometimes I would say to myself, I would say, how can this girl Go fuck this guy. I'm not going to say any names, <laughs> right? Because I like to get him on the show. Yeah. But the small penis, right? Kind of doughy, kind of dorky, you know what I mean? Yeah. And go be seen fucking him on camera mm -hmm. and not, and be against fucking a good looking guy. Yeah. Because. He just happens he's to be black. He's black. Right? Yeah. I'd be like, you know, good body, big dick, good looking yeah. guy, nice guy. I would say, like, what yeah. the fuck is wrong nah, with that's you? that's crazy. You know, um, and like Sean, um, you know, Sean Michaels, Jake Steed, um, Julian St. Jocks, um, Ron Hightower, you know, all those dudes from that era that predated me, F.M. Bradley. Um, Did you ever meet Ray him? Victory. No, I never met FM. I never met Ray. Oh, yeah. Either. They're you know. both cool. Yeah, they're both cool. Yeah, see, so, you know, all those guys did all the groundwork that made it easy for me to not have experienced a lot of racism that, like, you know, they made it very, very easy for me to, to come in and, and develop a position. Yeah. Oh. You know what I'm saying? They did all the heavy work um, or paved the ground that I was able to. Yeah, you know, I didn't really, because, you know, like, with me, it's like, I really, you know, didn't break ground as far as, you know, I broke ground in certain aspects of this industry for, for black performers, but I didn't lay the, I didn't break the, I wasn't the one that broke the interracial ground. That was done for me. Shawn Michaels, in my opinion, Shawn Michaels really did some serious work on that. And Jake. Uh, well, 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 didn't Jake's, Jake's experience was, was kind of fucked up because uh, Jake was hated on because he was too light. No, uh, Jake. Well, not too late, but because Jake, it was like... I saw Jake work with a lot more girls. Would work with Jake, I thought... Because he was like, okay, yeah. He was light-skinned. You know, he could pass for Puerto Rican any day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All you gotta say, oh, you're Puerto Rican. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm what the fuck, right? I'm Puerto Rican. I don't, you're racist yeah. to me, but anyways. Yeah. You know, I mean, he, they would, yeah. he would pass by sometimes, you know what I mean? Right? Yeah. You don't want your girl around. <laughs> yeah. He can pull her quick, right? Yeah, show a smooth operator. Not but, that that's his style, no. but he could, right? Yeah. But yeah. in any case, you know, all respect to Shawn Michaels. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we worked together, you know, probably a hundred times side by side, probably. Yeah. But um, so I so your um childhood. Yeah. So you the your parents were professionals. Yep. Well, 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 I mean, no, no, I when professionals in terms of they weren't like you know doctors or lawyers or anything like that. Um, you know, my, my father was a postman, um, and my mother was um, an executive assistant with a, a doc, with a family practitioner, with a doctor, and um, you know, so it provided a, a you know, stable, yeah, stable, comfortable lifestyle, you know, and um, my father was a veteran of the Korean War, and so at that era, he was able to get a house in a in a very nice new development. Um, in which we had been, I think he was like the first black family in the neighborhood. <clears throat> so by the time my sister, my older sister and I came around, um, the neighborhood had become like a rainbow variety of people. So it was like, you know, we came up in the best possible environment to, to learn different types of Americans. And we're all Americans, mm -hmm. but it's just one that happens to um, celebrate um, Hanukkah and you know one celebrates Christmas you know what's the difference you uh, uh, well you know what I find ironic sometimes mm. is that a lot of people strive to have a nice tan <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, a, it's a crazy thing it's just off the wall you know what I mean <laughs> but anyways 
Yeah. You know, I, she, you know, you already know what I'm saying. Like, yeah, you know, like, yeah. People are crazy anyways. You but can't, now it's not even just tans. I mean, there's other, other, you know, it's cultural appropriation, as it's called, you know. Yeah. Um, and there's many forms of it, but, I mean, there's many forms of it that existed. And it's, it's not just one way. It goes many different ways. The, the people's brains are interesting to watch. You know? mm. But um, how do you like it? Is that any good? What, this? Yeah. This is very good, I believe. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> he's vaping. Yeah. When, you know, because for me, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to get the makeup of a great porn star, yeah. right? You're going to be classified in the great porn star status. Mm -hmm, thank you. you know? <laughs> That's it. You know, it's already, it's already written. You know yeah. what I mean? So what is the makeup? When did you see or when did you feel you saw a girl walking by, right? You said, fuck. You know, your senses went wild. Mm -hmm. You remember, you know, you said that girl's ass, that girl's body, her shape, her hair, her face, her lips. Everything about her, the way she smells. When did it hit you one day, and what was it that hit you about her? Well, I think when I was around, <clears throat> would have had it been between like maybe between the ages of ten and thirteen. Um, I had a best friend. One of my two best friends had an older sister, had big ass titties, right? And you're a titty guy. Oh my god! And she had these big ass titties, had these big ass nipples on them too, and so she was only like. Well, how did you see him? I mean, her nipples were, like, always hard. It was, like, these big-ass titties. And, you know, they were natural because we were too young yeah. for her to have... This wasn't the time when people were getting implants. How old was she, you said? She, we were, like, thir like she, Same age? Nah. So she was at least four years older than us, uh -oh. five years older than us. So so when we were, when we were 10, she was 15. So as... She was coming into the young development as a young woman. We were developing as a young boy coming into our recognizing and noticing sexuality. So, you know, like every time I went to my, my boy's house, his older sister would come out with these big bouncing titties with these big ass nipples. And I think that's what, you know, developed me as a breast man. Right. Because I felt passionate about my desire of breast and I felt more intense about breasts than other kids felt about ass or, or you know what I'm saying like so if my, if my other buddy if he liked ass I felt more passionate for my love for breasts than he felt for his love of ass and then another situation that, that took place was um, um, and, and, and I think as a performer I think the key ingredient is how passionate can you be about women Right, like people might want to fuck women, but do you really want to yeah. fuck women? You think you, you want. You think you want exactly. <laughs> you, you think, think you think like you a woman, like, but, but how much? You know what I'm saying? And so my thing was when I was playing baseball, literally baseball as a 12, 12 year old. I think we were, 12, we were in the majors, which would have been twelve. Um, this the the catcher from our team, his mother was this hot like mafia like Italian woman, right? Like I think they were Sicilian, so they were like olive skin, dark Italians. And she used to wear these cargo shorts that were really short. She was hot, right? Well, don't tell me the camel toe was sticking the out. The camel toe. Yeah! And then she had the pussy hair, too, coming out. Oh! The oh, man. <laughs> and, like, this was, like, black Italian, just dark hair just coming out. She was doing fucking with everybody? She didn't. I don't, she no, didn't. No, come on, man. She was I, fucking around. I don't know, but when I was at bat, I would just remember turning around and looking at her, <laughs> and I was like, eye level with where she was, Miss Giordano, as a matter of fact, and at the level where she was sitting, I could see this fat pussy with the camel toe, and then oh. this black hair, so oh. that's what got me turned on, but that developed my life for MILFs and for pussy hair, and what's funny is, now all the MILFs are my own age, <laughs> so it's yeah. like, for my whole life, I've been, you know, attracted to MILFs, now I'm like, well, shit, she might be a MILF, but she's actually, you know, my counterpart. But, but, but Sometimes yeah. you forget you're old. Uh, yeah, yeah, but the thing is, is like, is like, it just, with MILFs, it's like, okay, it took me this to get to the age of a MILF, but my age for MILFs hasn't changed. So now that I'm at the same age as a MILF, anything older, I'm not going to necessarily be desirous of a girl that's older than, than I'm still going to like up women up to a certain age, yeah. you know, above that. 
<laughs> it's kind of like then I'm like, yeah, and then it's like, nah, it might be too much, you know. But wasn't it glorious, you know, when you saw a fat pussy in the shorts or a bikini at the fucking yeah. pool or something? Oh my god! All oh, right, to me, I still. I get, look at it to me. You show a girl show. I still remember numerous girls, right, yeah. with their pussy so fat, yeah. looking at me. And I think they knew that they were, knew they're pushing it out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Nah, but that was how I felt about pussy hair, man. Because I always felt like, you know, it was a decision to leave it. Yeah. Because they they know it's I there, it. and I oh my god, I remember like. We had this woman in our neighborhood that, like, we used to hang out at, like, her house was, like, the house where we all hung out at. And um, some days she would lay out on the back on a lounge chair in and, and a, and a one-piece bikini. So she wasn't all out there like that because it was a one-piece. But she would have her, you could, she wouldn't have shaved her pussy hair. She was about 37, 38 at the time when we were, like, 15 and 16. And so that's another reason why I got into MILFs, you know. Um, when I was 17, I was like the last of the cool guys. As far as who I was when I was a child, I was like the last of the cool guys to get pussy in high school. Oh, no. Yeah. 17? 17, dude. I was like, we graduated ah. in June. I graduated in June of 1987, high school. I got pussy May of 1987. I'm sorry, man. At 17 years old. <laughs> I'm sorry for you. First time, man. But I came out the box. I was 17, but the girl's 24. 17? That sucks. Like I said, I was the last of the cool guys. And the thing about it, was, it, it Why? Why? What the hell took so long? Nah, but I remember <clears throat> back then, right? Not for nothing, but back then, brothers, you know, of my complexion were not like the thing. We were not the thing. It was like Elder Barge and like, you know, um, the Puerto, Light Skin Brothers. Puerto Rican looking motherfuckers? Yeah, man. See what I'm saying? Yeah. No, not, well, not Puerto Rican. You know, but I'm saying Whatever, like yeah. the high yellow. I mean, uh, that's, <laughs> 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 that's fucked up. Um, the Light Skin Brothers. Not, you not know? high yellow. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, like, you got to be PC now. You know what I'm saying? You know? Oh, fuck that. We're not doing it's not, This is not the game. You know, it's not so, that show. Yeah, okay. We're free. Free love here. You free speech. Saying? You see that sign? The First Amendment, no doubt. Free but, speech, so free, we're free speech. Uh, so that was, you know, back then when I was a kid. You got to remember, like, brothers of Michael Plex, we didn't, it really was us until Michael Jordan, you know, uh -huh. and then Tyson Bedford, you know, but before them dudes, we were in it, you know. It was Elder Barge, it was, you know. <laughs> you want to fuck him up, go ahead. <laughs> no, it was Christopher Williams, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. Was, New Jack City. Yeah. Motherfucker from Miami. Who's the brother from Miami Vice? Uh, the, Phil, Phil Michael Thomas? Yeah, you know what I'm saying, brother? Look like that dude. Yeah, I heard a crazy story. That's what I heard. That he was messing around with Kay Parker or something like that. It was a big-ass city, Kay Parker? That's what I heard. From somebody, you know what I mean? That's I, another I one. I grew up watching her. Oh, my God. Remember yeah. Kay Parker? Did yeah. you remember? I met her. No, I never <gasps> worked with her, but I met her at Bill Margo's Yeah, memorial. rest in peace. But yeah. He was a wonderful person. Kate she was Parker, cool. Big ass titties. She was only in the business for a, one year or two. Oh, really? Years. Yeah, she did not. I asked her. She said, around like a year and a half or something. Damn. So she made some classics in the show because she always had that huge bush. I love those bushes, mm, right? Yeah. When I used to look at a girl in her bikini or even in the pants and I mm -hmm. see that fat camel toe, yeah. or especially if I saw hair, yeah. I would almost... You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Go like a Yo, but it's crazy because it seems like the last, what, two years, maybe, not even as much as three years, but it seems like the camel toe has had a huge, the fat pussy camel toe has had a huge comeback. Really? Don't you think? Like, I, like, I haven't noticed it, but I'm look, I always look. Like on Instagram, for instance, right? If you look at the, the, the girls, everyone's pulling their shit. Oh, yeah, but you know what? It's not it's not the real camel toe. Yeah. The cam <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I might be crazy, but I really think, I believe, the camel toes are not as big and glorious as they used to be. That's what I believe. They're trying to fake it they're trying because... To fake it. You know why they're trying to fake it? Because, you know, I've been... You know, thinking about camel toes and yeah. puppy pussies before I got in the business. When I got in the business, I used to tell Peter North, hey man, you see that fat one, that puppy yeah. pussy? And they go, what's that? No, not like he's stupid or anything, but like nobody really got the camel toes, really. And so over the last 10 years or mm -hmm. eight years or six years, something like that, P 
people have finally, after all this time, mm -hmm. finally recognized the beauty of a fat camel toe. And they're trying to front all the girls think they got a fat one and they yeah. don't. Well, I, you know what? Thinking about it, I think in that time period, you had the emergence of the bald pussy. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, now you're like, okay, you have a fat pussy and you don't have a fat pussy. But once you started, once you, they started shaving their pussies, you could see who really had a fat cat and who just was, you know, didn't, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, but, but I've always preferred hair. Um, and yeah, like I specifically can identify, you know, but you um, like them fat, fat ones or it doesn't matter. Um, I'm more lips guy, you know what I'm saying? Because the fat pussy would be the, the mons, uh, tucked in. Well, well, the labia, the mons pubis is on top. This would be the labia majora, which would be the two fat lips, which would give you the fat pussy look. Me, I'm about the labia minora, which is the two small lips that are, you know, and I like the big flower ones that are like to come out like, you know, the labia majora, the lips are my things. Um, but you so, know. sometimes we've seen, I mean, I've seen a lot of pussies, right? Yeah. They can be super fat with those little lips oh, coming out too. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when it's like that, it's like, um, I've seen, I've seen pussies that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that have three layers of pussy mm -hmm. to them. So you have that one lip, you have the outer lip fat, yeah. you yeah. have those lips, and then you see something else like a on the like inside. A, yeah, it's like a little like you. it's almost like an octopus. Yeah. Like yeah, like, <laughs> like, like, know, like it's like a little sucker yeah. in there, right? You and, know, yeah, yeah. You, you don't see it that often, right? Three mm. three layers of pussy. Yeah, yeah. To all the girls that got three layers of pussy. Yeah. You better know what you got. <laughs> yeah, and that's crazy too, man. Um Cause not yeah, not, it's very very rare to see that, to experience that. Yeah. What yeah. did you What did you want? Yeah, it's rare. Yeah. Really, I don't see it much, and you got to pay attention sometimes. Yeah. What did you want to be? What would your dream to be when you grew up? Um. Well. Well. You know. I. I think. Um. Um. At the point that I became a stockbroker, had that had been what I wanted to do growing up. Um, you want to be a stockbroker? Yeah, okay. yeah, because uh, um, around the corner from where I lived, um, there was a, a, a family that was pretty well to do, and and the the, the man in the house was a broker, and um, um, and uh, so watching him and learning, just seeing him and his whole swag, you know, um, that's what, what I was like. I want to do what he what he did. Um, them dudes. Um, come uh, every Friday afternoon, um, they would pull up and you know, in, in you know these Ferraris and shit, and you know, so it was very impactful, you know, image-wise, you know, back then. So they were balling out of control, fine bitches, everything. Uh, well, 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 I wouldn't have seen the the women that they had around, um, but but I would always see them leave work. Or, or either you would see like on a Friday, um, because it, it, you know at the time you know it was different, where you had <clears throat> you had predatory predatory firms like theirs, and you had different type of firms that actually weren't trying to kill the clients. We were trying to make them money, making money as well as ourselves, but we weren't predatory. But the predatory firms, we knew who they were, and they knew who they were. And it's interesting, every Friday morning, you'd have those firms where those guys drive the car into work on the Friday because, you know, it's Friday and, you know, they're going straight from work to wherever they're going for the weekend. And so you'd see, like, the, you know, the type of dudes that, you know, what they were driving because, like, on a weekend, on a Friday, they would, they'd would have, like, Lamborghinis and Ferraris out there and all types of shit, you know. So those guys made real money? Oh, yeah. I mean, those guys um, were making money in a way that, that wasn't necessarily fair to their clients. But that was one way to, that was one way to do it. 
the firm that I was with, <clears throat> that I started my first three years with, weren't like that. I probably could have made a lot more money comparable to what those guys were making, but you know, it was what it was. You know, we weren't, we weren't, we weren't churning, as it's called, churning our clients. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, probably a whole nother world to go into, right? Mm-hmm. But the, um, mm-hmm. must have been kind of exciting though, right? Uh, how much, what was the most you made in one year? Mm, I mean, I, I'd say by my fourth year, Maybe my in my fourth year because it took me about into my fourth year before I was making you know before I was breaking a hundred thousand. Um, but I'll say that my fourth year, my fifth year, um, because they were full years, I exceeded six figures in my fourth, and my fifth year. My sixth year was was wasn't a complete year. That was the year I, I, I moved to L.A. You know what I'm saying? In my first two years, I wasn't making any money. Because if you're a trainee, you're not making anything. So, like, you know, I was making, you know, my first year, I was making, like, two grand a month. And that was, like, pretty much, like, a, a handout from the firm. But once you're licensed, then you can become an earner. And then, you know, your money goes up, not literally overnight, but, um, you know, you begin making money if you work hard and stay at your, your desk, um, you know, so... <clears throat> 